Um, welcome to the June 25th meeting of the Hadley Public, Public Schools School Committee. Is there a motion to um, call the meeting to order? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, All right. Uh, public, public comment is our first uh, item, item on the agenda, agenda for tonight. I know we do have uh, a number, number of public here. Uh, if, if you would, would like to make public comment before we go into the presentation and discussion items, if you could raise your digital hand and I will call on you um, for public comment. Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to move into the uh, presentation, presentation items, items and, and I would, would like, like to just thank uh, all the public, public for being here. I appreciate your um, participation and um, attendance of our school committee meeting. It's, it's great, great to see so many of you uh, joining us. us. We have a number, number of topics tonight. tonight. Um, are, there are there any adjustments, adjustments to the agenda? agenda? I would like to add one. I just want to run by the school committee two requests for use of the fields. And so I just wanted to add that. And we, um, uh, let's see, we can add it wherever you'd like. Okay. Hi, Yamira. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks, thanks for joining. joining. Yeah. We just, we just got started. Terrific. <laughs> um, I, we just sent into the policy committee meeting, so I was taking a, a breath. <laughs> <laughs> Under, understood, understood totally. totally. I, I saw, saw many of the policies, policies that are coming, coming today. today. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll just stick, stick the uh, two requests, requests for use of the fields at the end, if that's okay. So that'll, that'll be the new um, uh, item J underneath the four. All right. Great. Um, and, and my, my only comment, comment about, about an adjustment, adjustment to the agenda, agenda it's, it's more just uh, full, full disclosure, disclosure that when we get to the commissioners updates, updates regarding re-entry re into school. Uh, uh, keep, keep in mind that those were just released today. today. Um, they, they were uh, originally, originally intended to be released Tuesday. Tuesday. Uh, and, and so, so with, with that, that delay, delay um, we, we may not have fully digested, or <laughs> I should say digested them as fully as we would have had on Tuesday. Tuesday. Um, so, so just, just keep, keep that in mind when we go through those initial, our initial take on those, that guidance. Okay, okay, any, any other, other adjustments, adjustments to, to the agenda? agenda? No. All right. Okay, okay. Uh, let's start with 4A, the superintendent summative evaluation for 2019 and 2020. So just as an overview, the law requires that the school committee evaluate, evaluate the superintendent in a public session, and those documents are then available to the public. You do a formative evaluation, which, um, you did your formative evaluation in February, I believe, of this year. And then at the end of the year, you do a summative evaluation. The school committee is required to evaluate the superintendent on the superintendent's performance in the four standards of professional practice. The first is instructional leadership. The second is management and operations. The third is family and community engagement. And the fourth is professional culture is required that each standard receive a rating and then an overall summative rating. The school committee is required to provide um, those ratings on each of the standards and the summative rating and uh, should also take into consideration the progress that the superintendent has made on goals. Every year, I'm saying this because many members of the public may not be aware of this. So. Um, Every year, the school committee convenes at a public meeting, and thankfully for Zoom, it'll be much easier for people to participate in this, but they uh, convene at a public meeting in the summertime in which we look at that most recent superintendent evaluation, the district vision and strategy document, which is also included in this packet, so what's the vision that um, the school committee with input from stakeholders, what is that vision for the district, and what are the strategic objectives that are that we are going to focus on in the upcoming year to help us realize that vision. So the evaluation of the superintendent, actual performance on these individual standards, as well as progress on goals. We very specifically tie all of the goals and activities to each one of the standards. And what that allows the school committee to do is 
the, the activities themselves provide a demonstration or lack thereof of proficiency in a particular standard and embedded within then a goal is a deliverable so that the school committee can actually um, look at what is it, what does the standard expect and what did the student, the superintendent do or fail to do in relation to that standard. Um, what I have prepared uh, for the school committee, which is a part of the packet, and I do understand completely that it's a challenge with the packet. We have to scan it out in, in PDF format, and that's where um, folks access it. But these documents are, um, are public documents, and within that, um, within the updates, the progress report that I provide to the school committee, there are hyperlinks to each piece of evidence, and anyone in the public um, has access to that. So whether it's a uh, grant proposal or whatever it is, they're, they're hyperlinked in there, the evidence is included um, as part of the self-report. And I'm happy to do anything that's helpful in terms of uh, summarizing progress, let me know what would be helpful. Okay, thank you, Annie. Uh, and hi, Paul, thanks for joining. We're just, we're just, we're just getting, getting started. We're on um, item 4A, which is the superintendent's summative evaluation. So I believe what we need to do here is there are five ratings. Um, the first four are on um, one, uh, one through four, the, um, the standards of professional practice. So there's four of those. Uh, we need to rate each one on the scale that is provided in terms of either um, a rating of met, uh, or, or significant, significant progress, progress, some progress, or not, not met overall. I'm sorry, uh, one, one correction there. I'm sorry, the ratings on the standards, I'm giving you an update that the ratings are unsatisfactory, and these are, these are statutory. They're unsatisfactory, needs improvement, proficient, or exemplary. So that, I, I gave you information where I am in relation to goals, but the rating exemplary, proficient, needs improvement, or unsatisfactory. Okay. okay, and, and then, then there, there is also a summative rating that we need to provide um, in, addition in addition to a rating on each of those four individual areas. areas. And Annie, Annie, I believe, I believe the, the four areas are, um, which are tied to the goals here, here instructional mm -hmm. leadership, management and operations, mm -hmm. family and community engagement, and mm -hmm. professional mm -hmm. culture. Correct. Can I, may I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Annie, you mentioned that in the school committee um, packet, um, along with the goals, that there are hyperlinks to documents uh, that have the evidence. Um, I just want to ask my fellow school committee colleagues whether they're able to click on those uh, links, because mine is appearing as a, an image file uh, rather than, a, than, than links, but maybe it's just me. And also, and also it, it might, might be easier for the school committee, committee and I can, I can, I can always reshare that. that. I also I shared that folder to you separately, separately outside, outside of this. this. So, so um, and I can do that again. Yeah. That okay, folder. terrific. Yeah, we, we had a link, link to a Google, Google Drive folder. folder. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to click on that. I just, I know we just told the public that they could follow along and I just, I just wanted to make sure I'm not on the wrong document, but I can definitely go find the folder right now. Yeah. Not a problem. Sure thing. So, so yeah, yeah, the, the hyper, hyper, you're right, that the, the hyperlinks hyper in the scanned PDF, PDF um, do not, not, they're, they're not active. active. Uh, Let me get that for us right now. Let me see how we'll do that. Uh, um, I'm wondering if I, I found the summary document to do more facts and evidence. It's, 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 maybe this sharing this as a view, a viewable, uneditable document um, might suffice. If you wanted to. 
Uh, I'm, I'm going to try that right now. Okay. And do that in the chat box. Would that be helpful? Yeah, for, for anyone that wanted to follow along, there's such a great work here. I think, you know, it's worthy of viewing and showing off. Okay. And let me go back here and there you go. Thank you, Annie. Sure, no problem. Um, okay, I have it. And now I need to, there we go. Yeah, Apologies for the public, public attendees. attendees. I didn't, I didn't realize, realize that the, the town, town website only had the agenda, agenda pages, pages, not all of the supplemental materials. So, so I, thought I thought it was, it was a, a Word document, document that would have been active. active. Thank, Thank you. you. I love upsides, upsides to Zoom, Zoom and then there's yeah. so challenging. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like we still, still need right at. Uh, Access, access to those if, if you're, you're able, able to make, make it open. open. Thanks. Okay. Otherwise, right, you're going to have to go through the bunch one, one by one. <laughs> so I have taken a, um, I did a share of a link. I copied the link. I put it in there. So uh, that's frustrating. Yeah, yeah the bottom where it says again, restricted, restricted only people can open, open with this link. link. Yeah. Do you know, yes. you know where, where I'm at? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's, that's where you can, you can change, change the permission so that anyone with the link can view. Okay. Great. Oh, goodness. Sorry, folks. Sorry, folks. Sorry, folks. Give me one second. Sorry. Sorry. I could also no. make a copy and share that copy. But uh, can, can you? You'll, you'll probably be faster. faster. That would help me. Tremendously. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm happy to do that. Thank, Thank you, Mara. Thanks, Thanks Mara. No problem. Okay, okay so, so we'll start, start then with, with the first goal that we'll see in here is um, cultivate a shared, shared vision that makes teaching and learning the central focus of schooling. Um, for, for folks, folks reading, reading along on the PDF, the PDF uh, it is page three of the PDF. PDF. Um, and, and so, so we, we have, have uh, a, a number of activities with progress indicated that are um, in relation to uh, a, number a number of things and initiatives that we've talked through in terms of grants, um, uh, opportunities at, the, uh, at both of the school, uh, Hopkins and the elementary school, uh, public safety. Um, there is one, we have something that is underway, significant progress in terms of engineering and design, as well as um, the district-wide curriculum audit and reallocation of uh, curriculum director, uh, any, any comments, comments uh, folks want to point out anything specific, specific on in relation to this goal before we give a rating uh, for, for this? Um, this is tied to, sorry, just pulling up the separate page, um, instructional leadership. Instructional leadership. And I will say for folks that the, um, I had just pulling up the separate We received notification that we were designated as an early college high school campus at Hopkins after I put these uh, this information together for all of you. So that actually, the early college, um, in terms of all the grants and successfully getting uh, the grants funded and getting the designation, all of that happened. So we did receive that designation. Um, that part of it is met. Getting the wall to wall is a longer, um, Goal. Uh, more, uh, five-year goal. Sumera, Tara, Ethan, or Paul? I'll just say, Annie, I think, you know, in this category, it's been an amazing year. I think but with that early college, high school, um, and the, um, just some of the other stuff, it's just been really, I think it's been an, that early college high school is a big, big deal. But I guess the one question just to weigh in is where do you think we are on the integrating the engineering and design and 3D printers? Uh, so we, yeah, we have, we actually have made some great progress of that. And when uh, Ms. Camuso reviews some of the changes to the program of studies, just in terms of adding additional courses, one thing that got in the way of uh, the 3D printers, not the only reason, but expanding the use of them and doing some more PD around that. Um, 
the uh, closing school didn't help. Now, granted, we had all of fall and the spring too, but closing school did not help. So it wasn't a priority at the very beginning of the year. We did put together some courses, as I said, that Ms. Camusa will be um, talking about in the changes to the program of studies. And a course that you all had already approved previously. And certainly the expansion of using those 3D printers, that will remain a priority for us going forward. We have purchased a great deal of technology for the two courses. The math course that uh, focuses a great deal on engineering principles, can't think of the name of it right now, and then another um, kind of engineering and design course. So we also have invested in technology specific for those courses that often well, and, and, and it was a mess. I should have pointed out to the, the project lead the way proposal and then that was awarded, um, but the innovation pathway is just a great collective effort by a lot of faculty. Yeah. It's a really great addition to our school. So I think it's been exceptional in this category. Yeah, oh, I, I would agree. I think um, the in terms of the rating, I, I would recommend a rating of exemplary on this, on this particular uh, area. I agree with that as well. I think that a lot of these um, different areas, they need a lot of time just to do one project, if you will, and she's completed and has successfully completed a lot of different projects that take up a lot of time and dedication, so I absolutely agree with that. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said, and I, um, I feel like I got to watch Annie in action, collaborate with the principal and the curriculum designer to reimagine and to um, and, and think about the way curriculum design supports um, students' post-secondary opportunities in an equitable way, and um, I was... I, I, I'm impressed with all that you were able to accomplish and the plans that we have for the next year. Thank you. I do feel I really want to give credit where credit is due. And these were teams of faculty um, that really helped get this work done. And there is a tremendous equity focus on this work. So early college high school and innovation pathways are programs that are designed to specifically address the um, the tremendous inequities that we see in terms of post-secondary outcomes for students, um, particularly uh, students of color and students who uh, qualify as being economically disadvantaged and students with disabilities. And I want to underscore, and this is, this is about our faculty, um, it is impressive, it is really impressive that we got these designations because our schools are so small that the state typically looks at our data in the aggregate. And so, and these are, and so sometimes cohorts of students are so small that their outcomes are not tracked by the state. So we made a compelling case to say that even though our aggregate data looks quite good at Hopkins, we are aware of, of the post-secondary experiences and we won't be satisfied until every single student has equitable access to post-secondary experiences and success. Um, so this was done very much around um, trying to uh, achieve an equity agenda, and this is, and also, this is also equally for students with disabilities. People with disabilities have have economic, health, and post-secondary outcomes that. Um, I mean, as a society, there's a tremendous amount of moral urgency around this. And so that's what these programs are, are designed to do. Project Lead the Way, we have decided to, we still have it, we've been awarded it, it didn't go away. We will defer for one year because again, um, doing the training, other things, it's very uncertain uh, with COVID. So the in, uh, integration, the technology integration specialist and I decided that we would uh, just wait one year before implementing that. The one, the one thing I'll, I'll say, say focusing, focusing on next year in the standard is um, I would like, like to see that the priority, priority and I know there's a great deal of energy around this, is um, when we look at our curriculum that we very specifically ensure that um, we have uh, implemented, we have identified and implemented an anti-bias curriculum 
that is at both the elementary and the high school. So since the curriculum falls under this standard, um, that is a place that when the school committee at a public meeting starts talking about where should our focus be next year, um, I, I believe that that will be an important thing to emphasize going forward. Great. Any other comments around this poll? Or are we good to move to the second one? Okay. So the second goal is ensure a safe, efficient, and effective learning environment. And that one is linked to um, the standard of uh, management and operations. We have some uh, evidence here in terms of uh, things, uh, things that, that have been implemented, implemented um, and, and met, met some uh, areas, areas around fast, um, intergroup dialogue, dialogue training, uh, responsive, responsive classroom, classroom practices that are um, showing, showing progress. progress. And, and we, we have, have some, some other uh, areas, areas around the um, SABERS, school, school academic, academic emotional and behavior risk. risk expanded training active bystanders and um, implementation evaluation of restorative practices that have not yet been started or no change continuation from prior year. Uh, I have a comment here. Uh, I don't see it. Maybe it's there and I'm just, I'm, I, I'm overlooking it somehow. But I think that there's really no better testament to the fact that we were safe, efficient, and effective a learning environment when we not only quickly shifted gears to uh, teaching and learning from home, uh, we had a plan before most of the state and most of the country did. We were up and running with schoolwork, I want to say that very first week. Um, and Annie, I, I've seen you make decisions consistently um, with student and educator safety in mind. Um, so I think that I would consider that to be an important part of this. And I think the stuff that we said we wanted to make progress on, yeah, we may have been held back because well, there was COVID, <laughs> but we had to sh quickly shift gears on what our goals needed to be in light of the, the very ambiguous problem that we were presented with. And so I would say we made significant progress and met our, our changed goals uh, for goal number two. Yeah, yeah Mara, I think that's, that's a great, great point in that, in that um, um, obviously, obviously that, that wasn't, wasn't predicted, predicted and, and wasn't, wasn't in, in you, know, <laughs> you know, a specific goal with the response to it. To it. Um, um, you're right, right has, has been grounded, grounded in um, um, ensuring, ensuring that there is this uh, uh, efficient and effective, effective learning environment, environment um, the health of, of the, the students, students and the staff, staff administration, administration all, you know, you know in, in the front. front. Is there a recommendation around um, the rating for this goal? Again, the scale um, is provided here from unsatisfactory, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, unsatisfactory, needs improvement, proficient and exemplary. So Heather, this is Paul, just before that, I'm just curious, Annie, if some of these things that are, were there some progress or not mm -hmm. started yet, if, how many of those things have been affected by COVID? Do you think you would have, so, it would be different without COVID? I think it would be, but, and I think, so I think it would be, yes. Um, but uh, I also, you know, I don't want to rationalize. So it wouldn't say not started if some of these things had been tackled a bit earlier. So in the case, for example, of the uh, in, uh, implementation of the social academic emotional behavior risk screener at the middle school, um, we, we did focus on convening and forming a positive behavioral intervention and support team at Hopkins Academy. We have a full functioning team at Hadley Elementary School. We wanted to bring that to Hopkins Academy. That's where we placed our focus. And we consciously, so the short answer is yes, because we would have let the team go and done some screening right around March. Um, so it would have been different if there hadn't been COVID. And if I did this work perfectly, 
we would have simultaneously had the PBIS work going with the support of UMass and we would have been uh, administering the screeners. Okay. With, uh, react quickly to a pandemic, then you would have, it would have far outweighed any metric here. So I just want to be cognizant of the fact that like, yeah, this is what we knew at the time was most important, but you know, all things are overshadowed by the fact that we could have um, we could have suffered some major consequences had we done things differently. She is working on I think that's a great point, Humera. I think we have to put this in context, and I think it's pretty. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm biased, Annie. I think you're great, so I think I think you're exemplary on this as well, given the situation, right? Obviously, you would have made more progress in some of these things, like you'd said, but I can say that about myself and many things in my life, due to that I've been home for four months. So I think you have to put it in context. Well, I think given the realization that has had to be made of health and safety of um, everyone, you know, that is impacted by the schools, yeah, I, I would recommend this rating in particular, the um, unforeseen circumstances of being exemplary for this year. I think, uh, yeah, there's work to be done. It's recognized um, and some of it obviously impacted by the current situation, but I think, um, this is an area that I, you know, I think we're very proud of. I agree with everything that everybody has said. And I'm just thinking about, you know, as far as like record keeping goes, going forward, just making sure that when this is, you know, stored that it's, it's clear the, the time that we were going through so that when somebody goes back and looks at these, if, if anybody ever does and sees the not yet met or not yet or hasn't started or whatever, that it is very clear, like as Jumeirah said, she had to quickly shift focus. So it's very clear that these were not met because of extenuating circumstances. So that way it's a little bit more, it's put in more context. Yeah. It's possible, but. Heather, is there a, a letter that you put in along with this review process? If, do I recall that correctly? I know that we capture this in the minutes and I'm trying to remember, Annie, what the documentation of each of the ratings, where no, else it goes. It's a box that gets checked, uh, the fun life of the public school superintendent. It is a box that gets checked and sent to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, the rating in each one. Comments are captured in the, in the minutes, that's correct. But um, yeah, it just, the evaluation itself is public. This is a permanent record and then the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education keeps it on file. I think the minutes should probably suffice. I think we can check that box and <laughs> with the asterisk by it. <laughs> yeah, right. Is there, is there um, any, are we planning to do any, not that anybody wants to do another survey, I feel like people are doing a lot of surveys these days, but is there any plans to kind of try to capture some data on how teachers and uh, or parents felt about the online learning? Yes, so the teachers, um, we have initiated some teacher surveys. Um, I know for a fact that the teacher, the teacher representatives, uh, leader, the teacher representatives on the leadership team absolutely disseminated a survey at Hadley Elementary School for the Hadley Elementary School teachers. I am not sure if we did one at Hopkins Academy, but we certainly will extend that. The parents also will be asked, my thinking on that was to ask parents about what their experience was um, and um, to simultaneously do a survey on how did it go. And the, and the timing was, was purposeful. I didn't know that the, the most objective data might have been right on that very last day, but also I was going to combine the surveys of how did it go and what, how do you feel about these plans um, and do that simultaneously. But I'm open to doing whatever the school committee would like.
I think it, this is Paul. I think it's good to have that survey, just that, that distinction. And maybe this is what you're trying to get at: is that there's a distinction between um, online learning as a concept and a, a form of pedagogy, and then there's how it was executed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I have different uh, aspects, different reactions to both questions. So the, do you mean more the effectiveness of that, Paul? Yeah, I just think I have at least one child who just as a uh, platform online learning, no matter how effectively executed is gonna be a poor form of learning for him now at his time in life. And so mm -hmm. even the best teacher with the best curriculum online learning still might not be the best tool for him. So I just want to make sure we don't get, we separate out those, that type of feedback. That's a good point. Can I ask um, Andrea Stanley, uh, your iPhone is not muted. Um, if you're able to mute your line, I can't do that for you. I'm sorry. Maybe you can, Anna. I probably can. Yeah. Thank you. There we go. I can't. Thank you. I, and I would offer to the school committee that we, uh, we look um, next year going forward that um, safe, efficient, and effective learning environment also um, includes part of that, of course, is um, faculty. And this is probably where we will want to make, um, be very specific about the connection between diversifying the workforce and um, having an effective learning environment. So I, I want to um, publicly say that I appreciate very much um, the recognition that the school committee is, um, is giving to me, which really by extension is to the faculty because it was the faculty and the staff who turned everything around with COVID. It was the faculty and staff that did all of that heavy lifting and made it work. And um, I would not, it's gonna sound rather crazy. I, I would not um, give myself an exemplary in this standard. And I do appreciate like, I'm so, this is nuts. No superintendent in their right mind does this. This will go down in history. Um, I would not because I've been thinking a lot about this and I don't know that in good conscience, I think we have a phenomenal faculty and staff. And I can't ignore the fact though, that when the faculty and staff do not adequately represent the students who attend the school, the degree to which that learning environment is effective um, may be very different for different students. And I don't say that, that's not me. I know what you hear, I'm, I'm not saying anything about faculty practice. I'm, I'm saying as a person who is ultimately responsible for overseeing the work of the hiring managers. Um, yeah, that is it. So it is extremely important to me. And, um, and I, yeah, I need to, I need to, I need to call that out publicly about my, my own practice. I need to call that out publicly. Um, yeah. And I think Annie, when we get the next item about diversity, inclusion, anti-racism mm -hmm. and equity, um, you know, this, this is a shared goal in terms mm -hmm. of um, what our faculty body looks like collectively, um, how they work together and how they reflect our district. And I, I do think, I mean, it's part of the discussion, uh, but I think it doesn't, you know, none of that is to take away from uh, in going back to, in relation to this, this goal and the effectiveness of, uh, you know, implementing um, the health and safety uh, procedures as well as effective online instruction goals that were there. Um, it all happened at once, right? And we've talked a number of times that we've met about all of the steps that had to be in place to support that ability to move quickly into that online instruction environment, not just steps as in, you know, what kind of setup and logistics we have, but the staff that are there to be able to deliver that instruction and support um, this online medium. So 
I, 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 I'm supportive of, of the comments you're making. I'm just, I'm trying to bring it back to the goal here, um, interacting with what Ethan has asked about regarding um, feedback from the field, you know, Paul's experience um, in terms of not just did we get it done, but how effective was it in terms of what did the students think and how did they relate to it? Um, I have a feeling this isn't the only time we're gonna have to do this online instruction <laughs> with students. Um, and that's another topic, right? The governor's guidance and where this may go. So uh, all this is to say, I think that, it, it, I mean, I would support in terms of how this directly relates to um, ensuring a safe, effective, efficient uh, learning environment, using resources to implement appropriate curriculum, staffing and scheduling, which is the, the uh, goal here in terms of the standard of practice. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going back to, I'd recommend an exemplary rating on that. And, and I really appreciate what you're saying, Annie. I, um, when I was looking, when I was reading goal two, I wasn't reading the granularity of it, the ensure a safe, efficient and effective learning environment. There's no more safe than like making sure our kids don't die and that we parents don't die as a result of putting our kids in a Petri dish with COVID. And that we don't like send people to graduation ceremonies, and you know, we are making smart decisions about that. Uh, when what what the timing is and what we stand by. Um, but there is a whole other aspect of um, of uh, inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion that we still have a lot of work to do as a society. And Hopkins uh, and Hadley Elementary School are a, a reflection of that society. Um, we're making some progress, but we're not where we want to be. So I really do appreciate you for calling that out. Um, and so I, I would I would support exemplary as well, and I would also support the one, one shy of exemplary. Um, but I, I'm willing to hear from my colleagues. Because maybe we can solve for racism this next year, and then we can give you an example. <laughs> but I, I will, I will solve that. <laughs> Let's, do it. Let's do it. Um. All right. Three. Thank you. Yeah, Paul, Tara, or Ethan, anything else on that goal? No. Okay. Um. Goal three, promote the learning and growth of all students and success of all staff through effective partnerships with families, community organizations, and other stakeholders that support the mission of the school and district. Um, there's a number of uh, pieces of evidence here. And I think, um, you know, Annie, we've talked about this in, in terms of how it ties back to the community, um, the parent surveys that we've done, the feedback we've gotten from parents, um, I think communication ideas that you've had in terms of uh, uh, being effective in getting information out there. Um, what do folks think of feedback on this in terms of the evidence that has been presented here? I think as a superintendent, um, I think she goes above and beyond to collaborate um, with the community and with other departments. And I don't think that should be understated at all. I think she goes out of her way way more than she needs to, to collaborate. Thanks, Tara. My, my thoughts on this one, I think, um, I think that you, uh, Annie, have made, um, you know, continued efforts in this area and even shifting up, you know, the mode of delivery, the outreach that you do, your availability, your accessibility. Um, you know, my recommendation on this one is at a proficient level. I, I think there's, there is still more there that we can do. There always will be. Um, and I think that some of the recent, you know, um, discussions that we've had involving 
um, community communications discussions we're going to have here about um, diversity and inclusion have helped to surface some of the ways that uh, I, I think that you're seeing that we can continue to engage with um, families, community organizations, and other stakeholders, as it says here, um, to really bring in and support that mission. We, we're going to talk about it, but I think that part of that mission of the district um, doesn't necessarily explicitly call out some of our intentions. And that's, that's where um, I think that there is a lot there to work with in the coming year. Heather, that makes sense to me. This is Paul. I support that. Yeah, I was just, I'll just say that I think it's clear, and, and I don't want to skip over two, but even looking at goal one and goal two, and, and kind of just kind of being able to take this all in, uh, it's clear that we are continuing and constantly trying to find ways to get things done, whether, whether here in the district or collaborating with other districts. And I, and I do, it is, it, it's a nice thing to see that we are constantly looking for ways to improve. And then, and then, you know, for the most part, meeting, uh, meeting those goals that we've established. I, I, and I, I apologize guys, I have a screen over here. That's why I keep looking mm -hmm. off to the side. Um, but I, I do, I do think that, that, you know, if we just look at the green, we can say that, you know, we did a really good job. Um, I'm really interested to kind of learn more about what came out of the, those things, those collaborations um, and, and all of these things that we, we did meet. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a good job. Great job. Um, looking forward to learning more. Tamara. I agree with everything that's been said. Okay, um, and then goal, are we good to move to goal four? Yes. Goal four, promote success um, for all students by nurturing and sustaining a school culture of reflective practice, high expectations and continuous learning for staff. I think that um, a comment on this area is and I know we come back to this um, in, in meetings often, but I feel like Annie, um, you've done an, an outstanding job with bringing in and growing, I'm saying this wrong, with cultivating the talent that you have and really letting them step up to the plate and take the lead on things with your ability to step in and step out, step in where you need to and then step out. Um, I mean, as a manager myself, I appreciate that because I think that you're the, the folks that work with you directly have the chance to learn from you and grow um, from that experience, but also own it themselves, move it forward themselves, represent things themselves. And really, um, I see that as falling underneath this goal because it's um, continuous learning for staff, but it's also staff development. And what better way to you know, have future leaders step up within our district um, and I see some on this on this Zoom here that uh, take that initiative because they know that they are in an environment that um, encourages them to do that and are supported by a leader who also will encourage them to do that. Ms. Camuso might say I left her no choice. I'm not sure, but <laughs> <laughs> she was looking at her when I said that. But you know, that's part of a leader's job. It's to, example. To yeah. Well, just on, on this. You know, one thing I just say overall, and maybe I'm missing it, is that there, I do see a noticeable lack of some subcategories on diversity and inclusion. But it's something we can talk mm -hmm. about next. Yeah. Just looking at this uh, broadly, not the subcategories, but the actual goal, that culture of reflective practice. And I know Annie, you and I have talked about this. And I just think recently some of your emails that you sent uh, have been very honest and open and um, thoughtful. Uh, in a way that to me reflects that it, it shows that you have high expectations as you just indicated earlier with your wanting us to downgrade you which is an interesting request um, to be you know, your high expectations for yourself for the community for the school uh, I think you lead by example here and so while that's not necessarily in the subcategories I, I think you do a great job of that. Thank you. 
Is uh, can I just ask? Is this kind of where we would see professional development for our teachers and for our staff? Is that yes? So included in this would be the what are the learning opportunities that we provide for educators? Also, there's a lot of emphasis in this on creating effective teacher teams, um, opportunities for uh, collaboration. We do have teachers who do a phenomenal job on a number of teams throughout the district. Um, but yes, uh, this does include professional development learning opportunities for faculty and staff. Is there a recommendation from the committee on this, this goal? And this is tied to um, professional culture. Well, I mean, it definitely looks weird to have exceptional across the board, but I do feel, especially in comparison to um, culture I observed when I first joined the school committee, there's so much more trust and collaboration amongst the uh, educators. Uh, um, I know we could be doing better and I know our metrics uh, should be we, we should be looking at other goals, um, but I would support either exceptional or the next level for this, uh, for goal four. So exemplary is the top rating and proficient is the one just below that. I feel like proficient just does not, does not, it's like there's no middle ground there. <laughs> um, so I, I would have to pick exemplary. I have no choice because I think it's way more than proficient and you know, yeah, exemplary is is saying that we're perfect, but the fact is we're, we always have an eye towards continuous improvement on all of these parameters, so. I think right. that's a helpful distinction here, Mary. I mean, proficient to me, maybe we should have normalized what we mean by these terms, but for me, proficient is going to work, doing your job, punching the clock and going home and just, you know, and the vast majority of the people would fall within that bell curve, but. I see this in a lot of these efforts and, some, and Annie's leadership is outside that. So it's beyond that. So if our other choice is exemplary, I would say it's exemplary. Uh, and just a quick question on that. I mean, uh, is that in our control or are we required by Desi to pick those categories? Um, those are the categories. Yeah, that is the superintendent. Those are the superintendent's ratings. Um, I suppose that you could create a different one and we could submit it to Desi for approval. I'm sorry. So there's like a cricket or something on my floor and my cat's chasing it. So that's really what you want to have happen when you're being evaluated. Okay, and that's why I'm my, looking I around crazy my, my and lifting on my legs because I <laughs> have crickets jumping on my feet. And <laughs> my cat coming and out. If you were exemplary, you would be able to manage those crickets. That's right. Yeah, apparently exactly. not. I'm not really multitasking this well. So Easily um, distracted. Take it. Take it. Yeah. We could. I can't, we could. You need um, a laser we, pointer. <laughs> we could, oh, that'd be great for the cat. We could, um, you could, the school committee could request, but right now those are the ratings that are in the, the legislation and the rubric. If you wanted to change, I could present that to the department going forward. I really think we should explore that, but for now I really recommend uh, for, uh, exemplary for this category. I would support, I, I, I agree with that exemplary on this. I think though to Paul's point that there is room here for um, uh, inclusion of the diversity, anti-racism, and equity agenda um, specifically called out within this goal. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that was kind of what, one of my thoughts about the professional development, because I think that's going to be important. Um, but the other thing I was just going to say is I think we can do exemplary, I mean, we're kind of holding ourselves to a high standard, right? And that, that requires us to come back to the table this coming year and, and, and kind of, you know, step up to the challenge again. And I'd much rather, you know, I, I like a good challenge. I'd much rather be in a position where we kind of have to continually push ourselves to be better um, than to, to settle at any point, so. Okay. All right. Um, so if we have that on the fourth, if we have an exemplary rating on the fourth goal, then we do need an overall rating, which is the 
the summative um, as a whole piece. So you have exemplary, proficient, needs improvement, or unsatisfactory as an overall rating. I mean, based off of the four goals here, I'm seeing where an exemplary overall rating would be your uh, logical conclusion, but I open this up for discussion. Agreed. Agreed. I'm there. And I just want to kind of reflect to, I'm just, as we've all been kind of talking and thinking about the events this year, I'm just curious how these goals might differ going forward, um, given the events that have happened this year and given kind of how our views and our thought processes might be changing. Um, I think it's, a, you know, I think Paul and Hamer both said it's an opportunity to kind of change the way maybe we're thinking about how we go about some of these goals or executing them. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, it would be, I mean, we would be remiss for not incorporating that into future goals, right? Um, both the um, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism uh, topic, as well as um, the health and safety and co you know education in a COVID environment topic. Both of those are um, just important to embed in these moving forward. You, okay. do, you do need to vote. And I think what I heard was um, standard one, exemplary standard two, exemplary standard three, proficient standard four, exemplary overall exemplary. And yeah. one, is that correct? And then two, you do need to vote. Motion to approve uh, an, um, an overall exemplary um, uh, evaluation for any and um, exem uh, exemplary for standard one, exemplary for standard two, proficient for standard three, and exemplary for standard four. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Annie, thank you for a wonderful year. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Exemplary, uh, exemplary year. An interesting thank all of you. I do feel like there's a lot, a lot, a lot of work that I still have to do, but I do appreciate your support. And I want to, uh, I mean this from the bottom of my heart, the things that you are probably most impressed with are things that um, are the result of the work of the staff and the faculty of Hadley Public Schools. That's really what makes that possible. In the absence of that, I, I wouldn't really amount to much, but thank you very much for your support. I do appreciate it a great deal. Um, all right, and your next item. Okay, um, thank you. So we're gonna move to item 4B, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism and equity. Um, Annie and uh, we have a parent uh, presenter and we're- No, actually you don't. Sorry, I should have updated that. that we don't have a parent, we have parents that can, that. Uh, uh, I'm not even sure, uh, she may, and this Andrea Stanley had contacted me, several parents have contacted me about uh, this, this topic, about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Andrea had specifically asked the question uh, to, you know, to what extent does the district um, identify metrics and evaluate its performance on metrics specific to, I don't think she used the word metrics, I think that, that I use that wonky, uninspiring word, but to what extent does the district evaluate its uh, progress toward goals pertaining directly to diversity, equity, and inclusion? And, right, right. Um, and so we had a great conversation about that, and I did uh, talk with Andrea. I talked to some other parents about this. It's some of the work that the school committee does throughout the entire year. I've mentioned, and I purposefully put examples of documents that have um, been generated by these conversations that the school committee has. So um, as I said, I get evaluated in the timeline and then the school committee comes together as the public has heard this conversation tonight. It's a public meeting and members of the public are encouraged to attend, members of the faculty, members of the staff to say, okay, what should we, where should we place our focus uh, in the upcoming year? That's a general 30,000 foot. It doesn't mean it's not important, it's extremely important, but some of that conversation is really used to drive the work of school councils. The work of school councils is where 
a lot of the real work happens. And the school committee would be very quick to say they have an extremely important role. They hire and fire the superintendent. They ensure that resources are allocated to support schools. They make sure that our policies are equitable and just and promote the outcomes that we want. But in, in terms of curriculum and instruction and on the ground work, that really is school councils. Um, and so I hope we see a lot of parents interested in joining school councils next year and reaching out to their building principals. But we have this public meeting around, what is this vision? What should our priorities be? I included in the packet uh, document that was generated last year at, uh, after that discussion, uh, that public discussion with the school committee. And that kind of drives, as I said, this overarching, where are we going to put our focus? Um, we have, uh, and then throughout the year, we do consistently at the leadership team level, at the teacher and building level, we look at a variety of metrics to examine, especially through the equity lens. I in no way am saying that these are sufficient or comprehensive. Don't hear me as saying that. I am obsessed with this work and I, I always want to ask, and I'm keenly aware of the fact that by function of being a white person in a society that was created um, by and for white people. That means that sometimes I don't ask questions that need to be asked because I just don't see it. So I can be just floating along thinking everything is fine because I don't see something. I don't even ask sometimes the right questions, but we're committed to constantly striving to ask the questions and ask better questions. And so for example, we ask questions and some of the, the data is in the packet. These are routine examinations. To what extent do we observe disproportionality and discipline? So we look at what groups, um, and I, I'll say because our district is so small and the language that I'm using here is directly taken from the demographic categories that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education provides, and if anybody in the public or any person felt like the, the category somehow um, didn't feel, um, I don't know, didn't feel dignifying, didn't feel affirming, please let me know that. But because of our size, we don't disaggregate by every race, ethnicity, every group, because the numbers would be so tiny, which speaks to a, a larger issue, right? Not just district-wide, but commonwealth-wide. That's something that April Camuso knows a lot about, which is we live in segregated communities and therefore we have segregated schools. Um, so we ask ourselves, um, what percentage of the total population are white students and then students who identify as other than Caucasian? Again, we don't spell that group out individually because in some cases the cohort is so small, so small to be identifiable. Um, and uh, to what extent then of all the students who have disciplinary encounters, and we might have a definition for that at the elementary school, uh, our data system looks at students who have had three or more disciplinary incidents um, that resulted in an office uh, referral, an office disciplinary referral. What is the demographic breakdown of that cohort? And to what extent do we see disproportionality? We ask those questions at uh, Hadley Elementary. We ask those questions at Hopkins Academy. These data and these documents are not presented tonight as a way to say, okay, now school committee go, what are we doing? This is really a, kind of a, a trailer for the public. Of this, this is the kind of analysis that goes into what is the vision that we have for a district? What is the vision? And we have talked about the importance and I, I feel this is a priority of the school committee. It's certainly a priority of our community, of our staff, of what I've heard from parents. Let's, we have the word equity in that district strategy document, but let's call out the, the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion when we revisit our vision this summer and um, invite other people to talk about how they wanna see that called out. So what is the vision that we have for a district? What is our current reality? Data answers the question about what is our current reality? We also recognize that not all data uh, is numeric and quantitative. The school committee, this was interrupted this year because I believe this is the year that the school committee would have done its every other year parent survey. So I, I'm pretty sure that this is this year and COVID kind of interrupted everything. Um, 
But we look at anecdotal data, we look at quantitative data, we, we look at qualitative data, um, and uh, we ask questions, as I said, about disproportionality in discipline, about disproportionality um, in students who are on individual education plans, like which students are uh, in spe receiving special education services, and what do we notice um, in terms of race, ethnicity, um, are they eligible for free and reduced lunch in economic status? With um, IEP data, we look at gender. That's really alarming and interesting when you look at our faculty breakdown by gender. But what we see statewide is that 65% of students who are on IEPs are male and 35% are female. Um, at Hadley Elementary, it's 74-26, 74% male, 26% female. At Hopkins Academy, it's 83% male, 17% female. So I would argue there's something there. Part of the discussion is when we say, what's our vision, what's our current reality, there's, then there's always a gap, right? Where we wanna be and where we find ourselves based on the data. What, what root causes do we attribute that gap to? And that drives our selection of priorities for the upcoming year. So. What, what's the strategy that we think is gonna close that gap based on the root cause analysis of why do we think it's happening? So we hypothesize the why, we, base to we select strategies and identify key priorities based on our understanding of the why. And then we see the extent to which our understanding brought about the results we intended, right? So if we think, what are we attributing this disproportionality to? What do we, why do we think it might be happening based on that why? What do we think we're gonna do about it next year? And then do we get our desired result? Um, we look at advanced coursework. That's uh, advanced coursework. We don't have a gifted and talented program. We don't have a gate program is what they call that, gifted and talented education at Hadley Elementary School. Uh, advanced co coursework would be courses coded as honors, advanced placement, or dual enrolled college credit bearing courses at Hopkins Academy. We look for disproportionality in that as well. Um, and, uh, and then a big, you know, an, an extremely important goal is, um, diversifying the workforce and, uh, thank you to the school committee for supporting the retention of, um, all of our educators, because that would have been a huge hit to a, a workforce that already is not diverse. Um, and, um, and I know that that required a significant investment out of school choice in uncertain times. So diversifying the workforce certainly has to be a priority. That is more in our control than diversifying a school, right? Because I'll say again, we don't just have segregated schools, schools which April can correct me because she's writing a dissertation on this, but schools that are probably more segregated now than they were in the 1970s when we stopped having mandatory and required kind of um, efforts to integrate schools. So schools that are more segregated now in Massachusetts than they've ever been. And again, schools are in communities. We have segregated communities, we have segregated schools. But diversifying the workforce is something we have a little more control over. We have less control over who moves into uh, communities and why. So these are some of the data that we look at. Um, and uh, that, again, was designed to um, help the public understand this ongoing problem posing process. What is the vision that we have? What is our current reality? Why do we think, what do we attribute? What do we think is causing the gap? And what do we wanna do about it? And the work on the ground, so that some of that comes down from that conversation. School committee talks about that. Public invited to that conversation because it's a public meeting. But then really school councils, the principals who chair their school councils with parents, school councils take that and say, what does it mean here in this context? What does it mean for our school? And what are we going to do with our school council members and this entire school community to kind of move the ball forward on these issues? So I'll say again, I really hope that, uh, especially now that we can meet with Zoom, that parents will find it easier to participate in school councils. And I know that our um, principals are very interested in having as an organizing framework for school councils next year. The um, Anti-Defamation Leagues 
uh, No Place for Hate framework, and also making diversity, equity, and inclusion um, kind of the cornerstone and organizing framework for the work of school councils next year. So I think, Annie, um, two of the things that um, seem like are most immediate um, are you know, we've talked about doing, um, holding our annual uh, or whatever it is, biannual retreat, mm -hmm. which is just a big block of time that we dedicate to meeting with one another with a very focused agenda, um, that this would be on there in terms of reevaluating um, what we may need to explicitly call out um, within our, um, specifically the strategy document, um, you know, vision, district vision, since we do review it every year, um, and how uh, those expectations are then realized within each of those priorities, and where we haven't explicitly um, stated something that is a diversity, inclusion, anti-racist um, uh, priority, and it's there underneath the surface, just not necessarily uh, I think um, explicitly uh, surfaced in the language that we that we can recommend to do that. Uh, that would be one forum for drafting that inclusion uh, language. And I think the other one is uh, we have a proposed uh, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees has has distributed um, a resolution that um, many districts are. Uh, examining and determining whether or not they would like to have some either in entirety or in some adapted form this uh, specifically what it is is a school committee anti-racism resolution and we've got a starting point with that but one of the suggestions was you know we're five representatives that are, you know, intended to be as elected representatives, you know, reflective of um, the the town and the school uh, interests, but we would appreciate, I think I would appreciate feedback from the community on this particular resolution in that um, we are not demographically necessarily representative of the town as a committee, right? And so I would welcome uh, input from from the community on this school committee anti-racism resolution for us to then bring forward either to a July meeting or to our retreat to determine whether in whole or in some adapted part, if we'd like to pursue this um, as, as a resolution that we can put our, our district name on, our school committee uh, representation on and have that be, this is where Hadley Schools uh, sits and, and from input from the community. Um, Heather, I wonder uh, if uh, for the purpose of accessibility, you wouldn't mind if I were to read just the part, uh, the, the beginning part that leads to before the list of the towns that have approved. Is, is that all right? Absolutely. Okay. So this is what such a school committee anti-racism resolution would look like for us, modified, of course, to reflect um, what parents and other community members would want it to be. Whereas all schools have the responsibility to equip students with their civil right of obtaining a free and appropriate public education, it is the responsibility of each school to ensure we create a welcoming community for all students. And whereas it is the responsibility that every district provide to all district staff, including school committee members, annual professional development on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And whereas every district will commit to recruiting and retaining a diverse and culturally responsive teaching workforce, and whereas each district will examine their policies for institutional and systematic racialized practices and implement change with sustainable policies that are evidence-based, and whereas every district will incorporate into their curriculum the history of racial oppression and works by black authors and works from diverse perspectives. And whereas we as school district leaders can no longer remain silent to the issues of racism and hate that continue to plague our public and private institutions, 
resolved that Hadley Public Schools and all the school districts in the Commonwealth must guarantee that racist practices are eradicated and diversity, equity, and inclusion is embedded and practiced for our students, families, faculty, and staff. We must ensure our own school culture and that of every district in the Commonwealth is anti-racist, that acknowledges that all lives, all lives cannot matter until black lives matter. Thanks, Humera. So that that's uh, resolution that Humera read um, is something that uh, as of, um, I'm gonna say Monday, it looks like there's about 20 districts that have um, adopted that resolution, accepted that re resolution as read uh, and additional districts or school committees are coming on passing similar resolutions. And I think that we would welcome uh, the review and discussion and um, collective input on how we could move forward with a, an anti-racism resolution that is reflective of what Humera stated, but also reflective of input from the community at large. So Annie, I think um, this is something that if we can, I'm not sure the best way to get feedback uh, in writing from parents, community, uh, getting it distributed and being able to go through that feedback for July. Sure, specific to the resolution. That, that's what I was discussing. It is also a school committee resolution. Mm -hmm. And we are elected school committee members to represent. Yep. Maybe we could instead have um, parents who have perspectives about it contact okay. one of us. And then we revisit it at the next school committee meeting. <clears throat> Chris, did you want to say something? No, I was uh, just clearing my throat. Sorry. Okay. I, I was like, I'm just texting him right now to mute his phone. <laughs> Just checking. No, thank you, Humera, for yes, that is that is a great point because it is a school committee resolution, not necessarily a um, something that Annie uh, or a superintendent resolution or a district uh, administration resolution. So yes, um, it is in the packet. Uh, so I hope that everyone has access to that, um, and it is on page. If I could open it up here. I don't know if I numbered it. I don't think it's numbered. No, but the entire within, packet. within the PDF, it is page 17. Okay. Um, and I think that, uh, yes, we would welcome input on this uh, in order to, I think, collectively represent. Uh, and, but also within the Commonwealth, I would, I would like to see our district represented. And Heather, I just want to, um, which I, I think it's important. You made the statement about uh, the extent to which the school committee represents uh, the town. And I'm not sure if you were saying that in terms of demographic data, but I'll just underscore again, and granted the most recent census data we have is still at this point, 2010. Um, Hadley is, according to the US Census Bureau, a 89% white community. I'm just gonna underscore again, segregated communities, segregated schools. Would we, um, and I agree that this this really could be, you know, a, something that's a school committee is, parents are reaching out to the school committee or community, but is this something that we could include in the superintendent email, a little blurb that the school committee is looking for this and maybe include sure. the link to this resolution, mm -hmm. and, you know, we can expand on this or adopt this or, or yeah. what, but just to make sure that it's available in case somebody doesn't yeah. watch this. Yes. Yes, and there is um, a link to it to the MASC website, if that would be easier uh, for folks yeah. to see it there. Um, and I know I'm seeing in the chat here um, so, uh, statements of support and wondering where to find the text of it. So we've got one family's vote and a second vote. So <laughs> thank you. Um, you have the link in front of you that you can put in the chat box? I, I can look it up. For it right now. I can, I can look that up. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. 
Um, one thing I you mentioned, Annie, was the importance of the school council, and I'm really glad to hear that this work will be taken up by that that group. Um, I, I wonder, you know, I've heard, um, you know, you hear from a lot of different perspectives, of course, mm -hmm. and and I've heard one perspective that the school council, um, you know, as with many committees, uh, it's hard to get things done. It's hard to get things done by committee. It's hard to just move the needle. Um, and that it could be perceived as kind of a toothless thing that dissolves. Now, I'm not saying that that's what our school council was or did or, but what would you say to um, the process that empowers our school council to be effective? So, I mean, the legally speaking, um, principals have a tremendous amount of authority. And I also say, you know, if you ask a child, you ask children, where do you go to school? You don't ask them, where do you go to district? The kids don't really care what happens in the district. They care what happens in their schools. And, um, and principals by law are, you know, the, the hiring authority at a school, just like the school committee's hiring authority is limited. The superintendent's hiring authority is limited. Um, so, it, school councils, I understand why people like any council or committee can feel like, it doesn't feel like anything's getting done here. Um, but they, they do have tremendous authority, right? Um, in terms of, of moving the work. And I would say our school councils also have moved a lot of work. Now, maybe things we're saying, we have different priorities now, um, but I think about the Hadley Elementary School Council last year. Another key component of this is student voice is extremely important in any school council. And that's just a fundamental social justice principle that student voice and student identity should be at the center of decision-making. Adults shouldn't be doing things to, around, and at children all the time, but children really should, should have a voice in their learning experience. Uh, Hadley Elementary students were um, extremely interested in issues of climate. As you know, starting two years ago, you got school committee got petitions on construction paper and big crayons without uh, addressing the environment from Hadley Elementary students. And last year, they got rid of plastic cutlery. They, um, I'm not going to do justice to the amount of like actual work that they that they made happen because it was important to them. I see uh, issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice is closely related to climate issues. Our youngest children may not see that intersection until we point that out for them, like who's disproportionately impacted by uh, poor environmental policy, bad environmental policy. Uh, at the high school, this, this emphasis on making learning more relevant and meaningful and connected to post-secondary experiences drove the council to create the career fair and the career speakers who came in, student driven. These may seem like very small things and, and this idea of organizing around diversity, equity and inclusion might feel more compelling to people as it should, but um, it is no small feat when students say, this whole experience would mean a whole lot more to me if you did X. And at the end of the year, we can say, we did X. We did X and that was driven by student voice. So they have tremendous authority in a very practical way. They don't pass policy school councils. They don't, they work in concert with the principal. Uh, they're manda mandated by law. They are public meetings also. Great, thank you, Annie. Okay. So just, if I could just pick up on that. So um, I think I, I like the idea of a, a statement that we sign on to. And I like the idea of having folks who are interested in the public weigh in, see if that mirrors their thinking, if there's um, other words to use. Um, I'm just curious though, Annie, when you talked about the, the demographics of our mm -hmm. town, 89% mm -hmm. white, um, what does success look like, right? What is our goal? And, and, and I don't expect an answer on that mm -hmm. because that's a tough question. Um, and I don't know if there is, a, I don't believe there's a single right answer. So that's why I'm wondering, we talk about student councils, if there's other ways to engage the public as well, and what does this problem look like? And, and what are some of those solutions? And 
you know, some of the, the language in that statement is really, I mean, I, I read documents all day and sort of from a legal perspective, wonder what's possible and what's doable. And there's some really strong language in there that strikes me as, boy, is that, if we're signing off, are we committing, we're committing to the ideals, I, I agree. Is it, can we really guarantee the racist practices are eradicated? Is that something within our power? We can, we can strive for that, but we're nested in a community and in a culture and a society that, I don't know if that's feasible from, from a school committee to commit to. Um, but what is it the town wants to commit to? What does the schools want to commit to? Yeah. And is there a way to have a collective discussion in a facilitated way? And I'll, I'll give a shout out to Humera for trying to do that, um, you know, and start that conversation about these issues. And is there a way to, to make that a bit more formalized, form a group that helps inform some of our decisions? Yeah, so I want I to draw attention to it. It looks like Andrea was out and it looks like she might be coming back into the meeting but I believe it was Andrea, but at town meeting. So there is, I also wanna be very clear that the role of school councils, I love this question, Paul, but I've also said this to parents, the role of school council, focus on the schools, right? But it can work in concert. Like we have a very yeah. active diversity club, uh, students at Hopkins who've done gender equity work, who've the Gender Sexuality Alliance. On the town side, I believe they're now up to five volunteers. Andrea, if you are out there, um, feel free to, to chime in on this. But I think the call for uh, people who are interested in working on a similar task force on the town side, this is something Christian Stanley attempted to start last year, maybe. So there are similar parallel efforts on the town side. Um, and he and shouted that out at the town hall, at the town meeting this last weekend and said, they're looking for volunteers. They don't have any volunteers. Um, Actually, I have an update. Uh, I received okay. a note from Andrea today that says that from that shout out, there were five or six uh, people who stepped forward. Awesome. And are uh, going to comprise the, uh, the committee. Uh, it'll report directly to the select board. They'll be actively working on what does uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion look like for Hadley. Um, and so I'm, I'm thrilled that that's taking place. I'm not on that committee, cannot take another responsibility on. I will work with them and advise them as they wish. Um, but I really love the fact that, um, you know, we've got our own complicated set of issues of dealing with young people who are coming of age under our care. Uh, and, you know, Paul, you ask really solid questions. We're never gonna, well, that's not, I'm never gonna say never. We're not going to eradicate racism, certainly not in our lifetime. But if we don't shoot for some radical, bold vision, we will fall way short. Um, and uh, in, in my view, I, I, this conversation needs to happen. And until the 11% the that is diverse feels included and feels that there is uh, equitable opportunities for them, to succeed in life, uh, we will be failing our our eleven percent. And so, if we keep our eye on that ball, uh, I think we will do our job, right, of protecting our students and and like ensuring their well being. I, I agree, Mary. And so, where, where I was maybe going, to, yeah, I, I, sometimes I do get a bit of caution when you when you strive for commitments that I think are unachievable maybe in our lifetime and I understand that the value of it's right right it, and so we shouldn't shoot for less um, that's fundamentally that should drive us secondarily I, what I guess I'm getting to is what is that next step so we mm -hmm. sign this statement great I'm not sure what what role I can play in as a school committee member to help do this and maybe I don't fully understand the role of the councils either so um, you can help me inform what role might they play? What role might this committee play? Is that open to us? Can we start brainstorming on what those next steps are? It just seems a little shallow just to sign this and say, we're good. Totally like, agree. Yeah. And you know, like Annie, Annie is like steeped and probably best versed to answer this, but um, within the role of the school committee are the three most important things to select and evaluate the uh, superintendent and we just modeled how we are holding diversity, equity, and inclusion um, as the standards we want to look towards for this next year, right? Uh, it was under the surface. We cared about it, but now we're going to be explicit about it. Um, and Annie will follow suit. Uh, we set policy 
and we have a report to get to later. Uh, and this is top of mind for the policy subcommittee. Tara and I uh, have already uh, been talking about how what what how this translates. Um, and I suspect that you know every one of our um, subcommittees and um, opportunities to make a, a, a difference. The finance committee, for instance, how um, so. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. The third item that we are responsible for is finance. So how are we financially backing up our commitment to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion as it relates to our hiring practices, as it relates to the supports that students might need if they are second you know, uh, English language learners or are from, uh, students from immigrant families or students who are from um, backgrounds of poverty where they may not have access to a Chromebook or internet or whatever, it's our job to be thinking about that 11%. And so I guess, you know, we know what our, our role is and I, I'm learning more and more about the school council role, but it sounds to me like everything that we can't do because we're sort of like not really allowed is what they can do with the principal. Is that fair, Annie? I think so. I think so. No, that's a good analysis of that. I think you've demonstrated there are concrete ways. So you made a financial decision at your last meeting that uh, clearly demonstrated the premium that you place on uh, having a diverse educated workforce. Um, and uh, yeah, and you've called it out in evaluation and you're thinking about it. So it's some of it is applying that equity lens in everything. And I think I agree, sometimes it feels small. I mean, I'm all about the aspirational goals. Last year, Paul, you said to me, when I set the goals, this seems a bit much. <laughs> good, luck, good luck with all that. Um, but I think it doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean it's enough. It doesn't mean we're finished, but a commitment to, to saying, we're gonna try our best to evaluate everything through an equity lens and acknowledging up front, I'm gonna acknowledge for myself again, sometimes I won't do that because I benefit from living in a society that was constructed by people who look just like me. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that I don't see all the time, but I, we're going to look. And I think there is something to be said for we're going to, we are going to apply the lens and the school committee applies the lens to the most important things. Who's leading the district and communicating what the priorities of the district should be. How are we spending our money? Is it equitable and just and what kinds of policies are we um, upholding um, and to what extent do they promote equity? Samira, one of the things that you did that everybody on the um, parents wise and public wise may not be aware of is what you led in terms of the forum last week. Uh, would you mind giving just a brief overview of uh, just recap of how it went and your takeaways from that? I'd be happy to, Heather. Um, so the work that I do uh, through, through my main role at Stanford, as well as through a side role that I have through an organization called Real Industry is to support students um, from all campuses and underrepresented campuses to gain access to the best kinds of learning that students at Stanford might get access to, the kinds of learning that allows them to design and imagine new uh, possibilities, new um, new products, new systems, new services, new nonprofit, you know, just or an even existing uh, uh, versions of the same that need to serve people better. So human-centered design. Um, and it's in the course of my work that I had the opportunity, well, actually I was inspired by Annie's email that said silence is, is violence that stopped me dead in my tracks. And I thought, well, what am I saying? What am I doing that supports this? And I know I, I've shied away from these kinds of conversations because I'm, I'm brown. And as a brown person, I feel like, is it really my role to lead that conversation? It's um, seven o'clock. Is it, uh, does it feel self-serving? Um, shouldn't others be doing it on our behalf? And also, you know, the other thing is I'm not black and this is really a heightened 
time of awareness for the anti-black racism taking place in our nation. Um, and, and one might argue that, you know, people like me, uh, people from the subcontinent of Asia and the Far East, they're doing just fine. They're doctors and engineers and that's, you know, that's broad generalizations, but we do not suffer the same kind of injustices that the black community suffers. So I uh, moderated a conversation um, for people in our mentor and student community. It was called Conversation on Race. And it was one hour fishbowl conversation where eight people out of 40 volunteer to be at the center of discussion. Um, and those people could be black, brown, white, uh, but they are the brave. It's an unrecorded conversation. Um, and uh, others deeply listen. Um, and you, they may raise their hand and opt in to be at the center of that conversation. Um, and that's uh, moderated. Um, but it's a time for deep sharing and making oneself vulnerable and, uh, and really listening to other perspectives. Um, and so I replicated that for the Hadley School community. Um, I think it was the week before last. It included um, a lot of parents, a lot of community members, um, three students from both schools. It included educators. Um, it included a couple of select board members as well as uh, the chief of police. And I have to say Hadley has an incredible chief of police. Um, of course it included Annie as well. And it was a very moving hour. And it's the kind of conversation, you know, you start with love. Um, people are so afraid to talk about race because no one wants to be classified or feel as though they are a racist. But the fact is we all have bias and we all have a bit of racism in us. And it's what we do about that racism. It's how we acknowledge it, reflect on it, understand how there are systems of privilege that um, affect us. Um, and at the first, the first most important piece of this is empathy, having empathy for others in our community, young and old, uh, from all walks and what their lived experience is. And once you hear that, you cannot unring that bell. You know, you wanna fight for the person who is living a few doors down or going to school in your own community. So I intend to have more such conversations. I think they just need to reach more people and then channel people who wanna take action into other pathways. Like there's a book club reading uh, for the book White Fragility, which is an incredible book for allies, wanting to learn to be better allies. Um, and, and I'll continue to do that work in parallel to other um, parts of our community who are addressing uh, this work. Thank you, Humara. I appreciate hearing that. Um, April, you have your hand raised. Did you wanna make a comment? Sure, I just had a quick one from a little while ago, but I just wanted to um, respond to the question about where to start and sort of remind everyone here that with the work that we did with gender equity, we similarly knew that we might not be able to change all of society or fix everything that we wanted to fix right away. Um, but we did the work anyway. And the place that we started was with the kids. So a lot of the work wasn't just about trying to change everything in society but it was about trying to teach the students the skills that they needed in order to voice themselves and make change, to do the problem solving and to take action. Um, and so I think we can think about it in a similar way. The one thing that I do regret about that work was that when we did it, it was pretty much just within the school and we didn't really engage the community. So I'm looking forward to this work where we might you know, have everyone um, together with that. So I, I think, you know, I, as far as I know, but Annie can correct me, I don't think that you guys are prevented from being a part of the school council. Anyone in the community can be if you also choose to do that as well. Um, but I think it can serve as a sort of guide for how we might approach um, the work coming up as well. So that was all. Thanks, April. And Humera, that sounded like a really powerful um, session that you had. And so again, I, I really appreciate you uh, offering your your talents and um, facilitating that discussion, which is not easy, 
um, but it is very valuable. My pleasure. I'm happy to do um, more of it. Great. Okay. Um, we've talked about a number of topics here in terms of the diversity, inclusion, anti-racism mm -hmm. and equity agenda, um, engaging stakeholders, developing goals, um, implementing evidence-based practices. Annie, you've, you've touched on some of those. Mm -hmm. We've got some links in the agenda to those um, and seeking community input on this resolution. I think that um, those help shape uh, at least a, a start of a pathway forward um, in coordination with the school council discussion that, that we've had um, for shaping next year and our visions uh, going into our district vision statement, our retreat um, and examination of this resolution. Yes. Okay. Can I just ask, I, um, this, this DEI work is incredibly important to me and I, and you know, we talked a little bit about it, but, and maybe this is a question for you, Annie, or just maybe it's a little bit late because we just approved the budget, but I think the most important or one of the most important parts of doing this work is putting our money where our mouth is. It's, it's a, it's an easy thing to talk about though. I'd say it's maybe not an easy thing to talk about, but, um, it's, it, it this work costs money. Um, we're going to need to invest, you know, a, in my opinion, a lot of, uh, a lot of resources in in this work and i just want to get a sense of like are we going to be able to do that is that something that we feel we're going to be able to do i would say to date um some of the ways in which you have that are part of the operating budget that support that support this work so don't hear me as saying any of these evidence-based practices are the same as an anti-racist curriculum for example i'll hold on i'll try to sort that uh, uh, sorry, let me just do that. Um, but we, you, uh, the budget already supports the work that we do at uh, Hopkins around training active bystanders. Uh, some of the student groups that focus predominantly on equity. We are successful. Our intergroup dialogue facilitation training, which was extremely popular with the students, that was a result of a grant that I wrote two years ago. The first grant I wrote for last year was declined. We shut down before um, I got another grant proposal off the ground. Um, we, in terms of what we can allocate out of FY21's budget, um, I can't give you a number right now because we don't even know where we'll be at with supplies, with some other things. But I can assure you there are there is already many of the structures that support um, environments in which students feel safe, can have conversation, uh, develop social and emotional skills, you are investing in those. So in the budget, PBIS, restorative practices, uh, training active bystanders, the grant funding for the work was specifically for intergroup dialogue. There was also professional development that came the year before that around anti-bias training um, for faculty. Um, I We will reallocate uh, resources to the extent that we're able out of the operating budget if necessary, and I will, uh, I have two more foundations I can hit up uh, for, for money in terms of proposals. So I, um, if I may, uh, Ethan uh, is not someone I really knew before election. And I would say that it was the conversation that I was just speaking about where I, I got a chance to hear about your background of working in Pittsburgh, I think it was. Baltimore. Baltimore, sorry, Baltimore. Um, also a very diverse community. Um, and you bring such amazing perspective to our schools. I feel so lucky that you are in this role. Um, one of the things I wonder about is what it would look like. Are there other school committees that have a committee on diversity, equity, and inclusion? And uh, to, who, who look out ahead for the kinds of things that other communities, I mean, we're not Baltimore, you know, in terms of numbers and populations, but um, what are the things that we can do with the resources that we have um, based on the knowledge that you bring to our community? So I'll just put that out there. I yeah, I mean, I think, so two, two things that come to mind that are things, and I would say that my experience in Baltimore shaped and molded me, but it's my experience at the school that I'm at right now that I would say demographically mirrors kind of the place that, that I live. Um, two things and, and, and 
Annie and, and April, you can speak to this, um, are the things that I'm involved in right now are, are you know, the, the, the organization within the School of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, like, you know, have we thought about or can we think about creating a position, you know, or create, you know, putting someone in charge of diversity, equity, inclusion in the schools. And then one of the things that I'm involved in creating at, at my school right now is a white anti-racist educator group. And that's really about helping, you know, your colleagues kind of lean into those difficult discussions, uh, lean into those experiences that they've had in a small space, kind of like the fishbowl that, that Humera did last week, which was awesome. Um, and giving people the opportunity to talk about their experiences and their feelings uh, and, and being able to grow from that. But also, uh, you know, to, to, to that some extent, having those really difficult conversations. Um, because I think, you know, as Paul, you kind of mentioned, like, you know, we might never get this right, but it doesn't mean we can ever stop trying, right? Like we have to keep moving forward. We have to keep learning. We have to keep kind of digging into this and, and trying to figure out how we can do this better um, because we do owe it to those, those students of color, those, those faculty of color, those people of color in our community to be better educated um, and, and to be able to support them in a way. So I, th I think those are two things that come to mind that, that we maybe already do, but that I would say that if not, we should definitely think about doing. Um, again, maybe not creating a position of a director of diversity, equity, inclusion, but like creating a space on, on campus or on the campuses where um, diversity, equity, and inclusion kind of comes together. Uh, because I think oftentimes, you know, we have those things in different parts of campus, but they don't always come together in one space. I mean, I can speak to that for a minute. I, I think those are interesting ideas. I think what's in what's important for us to remember first is what is that we're trying to solve. So the town of Hadley and the schools that we have don't necessarily look like everywhere else. So we have to think about what it is that we see as a potential problem. Annie shared some data. We don't know what all that data means at this time. Um, and it's not the only data that exists. So getting clear about that, and then from that deciding what it is that we need to do in order to remedy whatever the problem is. So I think we still have some more work to do around what the problem might be within our school district in order to figure out what would make sense. I can say that we have done some work um, with some sharing like that. I don't know if you remember Annie, I think it was two or three years ago. Um, mm -hmm. So there is, there's a group that we have worked with on a couple of different occasions, the faculty has worked with. Um, so we have done some of that as some different incidents have come up over the years at Hopkins. I can't speak to HES, I'm not sure um, about that. But I guess that's where I would say, you know, I think that the other thing that was mentioned earlier was that Annie is always relentlessly interested in helping to develop us as leaders um, and trying to you know, make sure that we're also a part of that work and not necessarily outsourcing everything all the time. Um, so I think figuring out what that problem is and then what might make sense within that. She's always willing, in my opinion, sorry Annie, to spend money wherever it needs to be spent. So if, if it's good for kids, that's what we do. That's what she told me. I've already been evaluated, so yeah, it's fine. You can say that now. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think, is, I think is great about her. You know, if it's good for kids, that's what she does. That's it. That's, you know, that's her focus. So um, I think that, you know, having said what I said, if that's what we need, you know, that's what I would imagine that she'll do. I'll speak for her for a second. Um, but it's getting clear about what that is. And that's why I said with the gender equity work, right? We know gender equity is an issue nationally, globally, but how is it an issue in Hadley? How is it an issue in Hopkins? What do our kids want? Because we can't just do things to them. It won't have any meaning. So it has to really come from them um, and, and sort of go from there. I, I think that's great. I, the only thing I the only thing I would say about that is that I think for our kids that are underrepresented kids, our kids of color is that most of them aren't probably going to speak up. They're probably scared to death. And, and I, I'm not saying that they don't already. What I will, I will just kind of put a plug out there. I don't know if it's a plug, but um, as I may have mentioned, I work at a boarding school. And, and if you guys have Instagram um, right now at almost uh, all of these New England boarding schools, there's a black at 
fill in the blank boarding school. Um, I, I don't think it directly relates to what's happening at Hopkins or what could be happening at Hopkins or Hadley in general, but I think it's a good place to start in terms of predominantly white institutions um, and what students of color are kind of dealing with on a daily basis. And I don't want to say for anything that it has anything to do with, with Hadley or Hopkins or Hadley Elementary School. I think it's just a good, good place to go learn um, uh, and, and just kind of see how, how students of color feel. Um, you know, kind of looking back on their experiences at, at the schools that are predominantly white. But I also know that it's a very different scenario. Yeah, we did also do some work several years ago um, in order to show some of those experiences just with students of color. But I guess something to look at might be, you know, as sometimes happens to things, you do some work and, and you're getting things done and then those kids leave. And so it's how to sort of continue that and maybe to come back to that. If those students graduate and you have more students. Um, is that, you know, that it's been a little while. So I think that's a great point. Okay. And Ethan, thank you too for, um, you know, bringing in your background and experiences and helping to shape this discussion. Cause as, as we all get to know you and work with you, it's, it's definitely appreciated. And I think as we've talked about, you know, this is a open forum and welcoming um, you know, those valuable experiences that you have and perspectives that you can bring uh, just from your, your own experience. Absolutely. Okay. All right, I think with that, are, are we ready to move mm -hmm. to 4C? Mm -hmm. We've got the, the commissioner's update, um, a hot off yeah. the press today for the fall vision sure, yeah. um but we also have summer school re-entry um i know we don't want to we would be remiss for not mentioning uh, you know what is going on this summer because as annie's reminded me um we are you know on ahead of the game i feel like in in terms of ambitiously um holding summer school uh activities so annie take it away yeah just briefly so the big um uh let down here the fall guidance initial there'll be final fall guidance in the fall the initial guidance came out today i have explained to parents in the newsletter we had a team of educators and leaders who met twice a week while during the entire closure we focused on doing that work and thank you for noticing uh, our, our faculty was able to do really good work because we focused on doing everything we could to support them and make that possible and to support families during the closure um, those folks said and it made sense let's not get ahead of ourselves let's wait for the guidance we shouldn't expend a whole lot of energy in the absence of guidance the initial fall guidance came out today like i said they'll be final um, i expect i will be most of the people on that group and there's teacher representation that core group and it's small for a reason in order to be effective and expeditious because it's a short window to be prepared for the fall but I will ask those folks to just review that initial guidance and we'll convene July 6th. And part of what I'm going to ask them to do is look through the guidance, which is public, it's on Desi's website, and I'll put a link to it in the newsletter this weekend, um, is to just start thinking about who needs to be in the planning for certain things. So I do not want parents or students or anyone to hear that people will be shut out of this. We're just going to try to be very thoughtful about engaging people at critical points so we can we can move the work and not have it overwhelm us and exhaust us. Final guidance will be out in July. I would look to schedule school committee after that final guidance is out and we've done some tweaks on a preliminary plan. No plan goes forward without school committee approval. So I need the public to hear that too. Nothing will happen. No plan for opening happens without the approval of the school committee to be discussed and deliberated in an open session. Um, but that's how we'll, we'll, we'll start working on that work. And um, even though the commissioner sent it to us at 11 o'clock last night, I'm sorry, folks, I'm in bed at 11 o'clock. And uh, I had a lot going on today. So I will read that initial guidance this weekend. Probably the only superintendent in the Commonwealth who will actually say it publicly. I was asleep when it came out and I didn't wake up for it. Um, but I am very proud. And this is a social justice piece that goes unnoticed. Um, Heather said we are looking at providing summer programming for students who are who we would consider high intensity, so very involved students. 
who have suffered the most, Governor Baker called this out today, are students with complex and involved and significant special needs have bar none suffered the most as a result of school closures. And it has placed an inordinate burden on their families. Families of neurologically, what we would say neurologically, typically developing children, children without disabilities, they often felt stressed during that closure. There was a lot of stress for families of children who have significant needs. The vast majority of districts in our region are doing remote uh, extended school year services. It is extremely limited. They jumped right to talking about the fall. I get it because 97% of parents are the parents who are worried about the fall. And 3% of our parents have kids who need something right now. So we're getting final summer guidance. We're looking to have summer programming not nearly as long as it was last year. And this is only happening because of our great special educators and our director, Pam Haywood. My job is to be of service. She tells me what she needs and I say, all right, I'll go get it. And she's leading that work, but it's critical and it's an unsung part of social justice. Um, those families, those children, it's easy to not pay any attention to that because there's so few. How much noise can you make? And sadly, a testimony to special education in general, you're talking about families who become socialized to accept with gratitude, to demand nothing. Let me put it that way. They, they grow accustomed to demanding nothing because everything is a fight. Everything everybody else gets to take for granted. They have to claw and scratch and fight to get for their children. Um, and so sometimes they choose to be silent because they're frustrated. And sometimes I believe school districts socialize them into silence because it seems futile. So I'm proud of the work that we're doing. That's our first priority and it's a priority that matters. And it doesn't matter that it's a small group of kids and then we'll move into the fall. So to be continued. That's that. Okay. So obviously a lot more to come on this. Mm -hmm with the specifics around uh, guidance, um, you know, configurations, uh, building, uh, all of that kind of thing, uh, uh, topics in terms of uh, health and safety, right? But also being able to deliver effective instruction for um, all students. Okay, um, and I know on a kind of related uh, topic, and we're going to talk about this in our school committee reports, there is a, um, a resolution around uh, COVID-19 expenses that are related directly to um, uh, both immediate, you know, uh, requirements, but also future requirements for uh, personal protective equipment, things like that. So we'll talk about that in um, coming up in the reports and discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, anything else on the commissioner's update? No. Okay. <laughs> I'll let you know when I read it. No, that's really normal, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yes, so bear with us. <laughs> yes. read it as well. Uh, okay, April, we have the curriculum handbook. Thanks. I'll try to be quick too, because I know I have a few things that I wanted to share, uh, a couple of which I wanted to share just to close out the year and my time as director of curriculum before I moved on to my new role. And some, as we noted earlier, were interrupted a little bit, um, but the handbook, I could kind of do whether we were in school or not. I could work on that and get some feedback through email. So you should have, I don't know if everyone has now, but I believe you guys have the whole handbook in there. Um, and I'm not gonna go through the entire thing, but I'll just talk about a few larger takeaways or things I wanted to point out in my thinking. You can see that there's an appendix at the end that's sort of like a, a little mini lit review just to share some of my thinking around curriculum mapping in general. But one of the things that you might be aware of was that there was no curriculum handbook um, and not much of a formal review process, um, which does not mean that curriculum was not looked at <laughs> or updated. I should say there wasn't a standardized process that might be more accurate. Um, and every time we had new standards updated from the state, teachers did get together and work on that and submit that. But what we're really trying to do is have 
one clear process and also make sure that our curriculum can be shared with the community. Something that helps it being shared with the community is making sure that the curriculum documents themselves are standardized. Um, I have talked a little bit about the idea of moving to a web-based system like Atlas. Um, so we've discussed that a little bit. That I guess to get interrupted by the closure because I was going to set up uh, a time with the other department chairs and a couple of teachers from ATS to look at that and see in a demo whether or not it was something that they feel that they would use. Um, so that might be some work to look at in the future. But without that, we can still have you know some basic templates that everyone uses some standardized language. Um, so the handbook goes through what curriculum mapping is just to make sure that everybody in the district has an understanding of that. People come from some different places, different experiences and avenues to become teachers. And in our district, because it's smaller, um, our teachers are generally in charge of writing and revising their own curriculum, which is not necessarily true everywhere. Um, so making sure that everybody has the information that they need. So it goes through the difference between essential maps and personal maps, essential being the more formal and finalized ones um, that would be reviewed and adopted. And then personal is kind of what a teacher would keep throughout the year as they might make some notes or, or adjustments, or they might say, oh, I found this speech and this is really good and maybe we should add this to the curriculum document for later. I also have a lot of language in the handbook about the desire to have the mapping process be collaborative. Um, one of the things that you'll get to hear a lot more from me as we get to know each other better is that I'm really interested in teacher collaboration. And so, I personally believe that the mapping process should be collaborative, both in writing and revising it, and then also, as you will see, in reviewing that as well. Um, I think that our best thinking comes when we are working together. We can share that social capital, our knowledge of best practices and instruction of text. When we moved to uh, remote learning and I started working with Jason Burns, I needed some ideas about uh, women's literature for a section um, in the history unit that we were doing together. And I reached out to my colleagues in the English department to get some ideas about that. So, it, you know, there's stuff that you know, but there's a lot to remember. Uh, so it's always helpful to have other people with you in working on that. The, the part that might interest you guys a little bit more, um, and certainly what, I guess what I'll say I'll be looking for in the future would be some feedback on this process. Um, I know I'm not in this role next year, but I don't really want to see this work just die. So, so I'm still interested in continuing this and would appreciate some feedback on the process of how to review the curriculum and when and who's on the committee. So essentially, I've put together three different committees. The first one, which would be a department or grade level committee. So the teachers who are essentially working with those curriculum documents. Um, they would review that in the fall using some tools from DESE's Curate, uh, which are pretty extensive. If you haven't looked at them, there is a link in the document to do that. And then once it moves from there, it would go to the district committee, which would have the building principal, director curriculum, or superintendent in their absence, and a content teacher, one from each school. And then after that, it would also, at the same time, actually not after, at the same time, it would move to a community committee. So something that I think is really important is to have all stakeholders involved in um, reviewing the curriculum. You will see that there's one distinction though in that the district committee I've suggested does provide input that would likely be implemented, whereas at the community committee, I've left it more as um, reviewed rather than as a, a mandate to be implemented, but that the feedback would be reviewed and taken into consideration. Um, the community committee would include the superintendent, director of curriculum, school committee member, two parents and then two students. Um, so wanting to make sure that everybody had access to that. So it kind of just goes through all of those steps in that process, provides some resources and the templates to get people started. It talks about where the curriculum documents are. I did, um, one of the things I did this year was make sure that we had every document in its most updated form in one shared Google Drive folder. Um, so that took a little bit of time and making sure that we had all of the correct ones because uh, we you know, had them previously on the, the network drive and there's some documents that are many pages and some that are one page. So I've had them all in one place. Again, they don't all look the same now, but I would like to see them look the same. I think that would be easier for other new teachers, for students, for parents. Um, I know that we want the documents to be made public, a 
part of where we're stuck at right now is how to make them public. So again, if we used a system like Atlas, we could make all of or part of the documents public. We don't have that right now. Uh, if you go to the English department website, you can see our curriculum documents up there because I just I don't think anyone goes to that website, but I have one for the English department <laughs> and uh, the documents are up there. So I put those there for the past few years. Um, but we haven't quite figured that out because there's not necessarily a way to get our, our whole Google shared drive folder into a public forum. And we haven't yet decided, you know, do we want to share the entire document with the community or do we want to share the essential question and the major assessments or whatever it may be um, from that because they can get kind of lengthy and, and less interesting maybe to the to the general public. So that was the, the first thing. I don't know if anyone has any comments or questions about that before we move on to the other one. No questions from me. Sorry, but this is Paul, just to make sure I understand. So this would be for all existing classes and new classes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so in the handbook, it does talk about, you know, in in a place where you would like to create a new class and uh, a new curriculum document, the process by which you would do that within your own department in school. And then there's also, once you have that document, what the formal review process is. And the formal review, there's a calendar, so not every subject would be done every year because it's fairly time consuming to look through all of those documents and review them. So it would rotate so that each subject area would be formally reviewed every few years. But departments within themselves and grade levels and teachers kind of do that continuously um, anyway. But then to make sure, right, that it has everything that it needs to have, we have to add in the formal review process. Is this a big lift for, for teachers to put these a, all together? A big lift? Like, yeah. do they enjoy it? <laughs> Is it a big workload? Oh. <laughs> okay, I have to comment on their enjoyment. Enjoying it. And <laughs> exactly. I enjoy it. <laughs> they, don't, they don't always. Um, it depends. So where the document already exists and you're not making significant changes, not really. When, they, when we have a new course, that can be a little bit more time consuming. Traditionally, what we've done in the past and this is referenced in the handbook, is that teachers might take a day during the school year for a PD day, or they might put in a request to be paid over the summer to work on curriculum. Um, Annie, I don't know how often you honor those or not. She's honored mine in the past to, to work on new curriculum and other members in my department, I can speak to that. Um, which is, you know, I think sometimes a preference so that you don't miss the, the days in the school year with the kids, where we have subjects who have all new standards um, like the science department, for example, they tend to devote some of their department meeting time since it's the entire department and it's the addition of new standards. So they'll work in their monthly department meeting times on that as well. So it can kind of be done in any of those times. So again, depending what you're doing, the, the amount of work varies. I would also say it depends on your level of skill and knowledge around curriculum development. One of my suggestions in the handbook is to have training and professional development for newer teachers around curriculum mapping. And the one thing I would say about this is it becomes because that, that system that you're recommending, April, provides the community and the school committee an opportunity to apply that equity lens annually to curriculum, right? And ask who's represented, who's absent, what are we reading? What are we asking? What are we studying? So it creates an entry point. You can't apply an equity lens if there aren't entry points for you to do so. Right. And so that would make it a little bit more systemic. Right now, again, uh, whether or not those things are attended to can sometimes just be done by specific departments. So Annie did ask the English department a few years ago to take a look at the diverse representation in the English department curriculum. And so we did do that at the time. We just did another review of the text and grades three through eight last summer. Uh, and that was one of the aspects that we were looking at as well. And all of the new curate tools, um, that is something that's in there. But having that formal review process makes sure that it's done for every subject in a regular, um, consistent way. Annie and April, I'm gonna need to step away for a minute. I need to find a charger or my laptop's gonna <laughs> die on me. That's fine. Do you want me to go on to the next one? Yeah, if folks are ready. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and again, if anyone does have any other feedback, if you guys look through uh, the curriculum handbook and you notice anything, please feel free because I sort of work out a process, you know, that seems to make sense. Um, but usually on the first run, there's something that someone's forgotten. So feel free to, to shoot me an email about that. The next thing that I wanted to just share was the summary of the math PLC. So we did make it through most of the math PLC. There was only one more meeting in April that we were supposed to have. So we had our last meeting actually on March 3rd, right before school closure, uh, which was nice. We only had one left in April to sort of wrap up our last set of training. Um, and again, this is a little bit longer, so I'll just point out a couple of different pieces in here. So the math PLC had three main goals. The first one was to increase teacher collaboration and teaming. The second one was to use social capital to increase teacher knowledge around content and pedagogy. And then the third was to build um, student achievement as well through the teacher collaboration around student data analysis. So a uh, main source of looking at this PLC was using the TCAR, which I think is an attachment in here as well, the teacher collaboration and assessment rubric in order to um, use the observation of the team itself and sort of quantify that. We use benchmark data from the child study teams from a study I had done the, the year before. Um, and then I applied the TCAR to one of the meetings where Ms. Gladstone facilitated the meeting. And that's what you can see where it says actual scores in March. And then in the last column of the table, it shows our growth um, or their, the PLC's growth. So overall, the PLC grew by 80%, but you can also look at the table to see the subgroups there. And what we had hoped for was that the PLC would grow by 95%. So I feel pretty good about that. We weren't that far off and we still had one more meeting um, to look at. I did also give a survey to the participants, which they would have done that again at the end. So we only had the one. That survey though, I did tell them uh, was only going to be viewed by me and by the other people in the PLC. It was essentially asking them to reflect on their work and their knowledge. And so we wanted to keep that confidential for them. That way they felt that they could be honest and share the things um, that they thought at the time. So a big part of working together in a PLC is learning to develop that trust in order to be comfortable with some conflict and disagreement um, and to then learn and grow. So a lot of the attention was on those different aspects of collaboration. I went through some of the ones that the, the PLC scored well on and some that they're still growing. So in terms of dialogue, that was really the strongest. And that's where we look at the PLC using agendas and protocols um, and sharing some talking time. And then some places where they're still growing would be around evaluation and action taking. That makes sense as those are places where they really need to be looking at student data. So gathering and collecting that student data consistently, analyzing it, identifying interventions, documenting those, and then doing something with that. And so uh, a piece of that is doing this in a systemic way um, or systematic way. And since that's not currently happening um, with everybody and, and with that group all together, that's an area where they're still sort of working on some things. So overall, the PLC did make some great gains in terms of collaborating with one another. They did start to hone some of those protocols around looking at student data and coming to consensus together. Um, they did share some best practices. They also did some work which is attached around essential skills and common language. This was really one of the parts that I thought was most meaningful, especially if you were sitting there just listening to them talk about the sort of intricacies of math um, and what's most important and, and getting them to go from, well, every skill is important and just really focusing in me saying, well, yes, but if you had to choose some, which are the ones that really matter? And, and of course they want all of them to matter. Um, so they were working on that and through some of their data analysis of student work, had conversations about common language, noticing that when someone's in second grade, a math term is called one thing, and then when they have them in 10th grade, it's something else. And making sure that everyone's clear over time as to what that language is. We talked about how the English and History Department had done that six through 12 a few years ago around writing and some of the benefits around that for students, even if it becomes a new term, saying to them, 
you know, we call a thesis a thesis here. Uh, and another time we just call it a claim, right? So we start getting used to those different languages and making that explicit for students so that they know it's the same thing. So what they did was develop this chart which combines those essential skills that we want all students to have in order to be successful in math with common language. And that's what they were working on as we were interrupted. Um, I'm not sure that they would have finished it by April either because it, it takes some time and it's a lot of conversation. Um, but they were working on it, and so I would like to see them continue that work and complete that. This is something that they thought could be shared with various stakeholders, so with parents, with students, with other teachers, um, not just for the math teachers and departments. That's kind of who the, the aimed audience was for this. Um, and it really, it made a lot of progress. I included one of the drafts in here as well, and then the final one um, was the one that Ms. Gladson made in a really nice organized way that, that has both of them on here. Um, so that was some of the work that they left off. So I'd like to see them continue that and continue working on some, some student analysis and some teacher sharing. One of the items I mentioned in the report as well was that really we would like to see them do some more observations of each other and some um, sharing of one another's work. We had a teacher who was gonna bring in some work for that last meeting, which we couldn't have. We did some work earlier on observing teachers just through some Desi videos, which they were very comfortable sort of sharing feedback on. But it's important to build that trust in the PLC first before people feel comfortable sort of taking that feedback about themselves. Um, so we were working towards that goal. So for me, I would love to see the PLC continue into next year, especially since we know um, that math might be problematic for our students with the closure. And I feel very strongly that collaborating together um, and teachers sharing those best practices with one another and solving those problems together is what's really going to lead to student gains. That's great, April. Very ambitious here. <laughs> Thanks. Are there any questions or comments around this? No, thank you for doing this work. Um, so needed. Um, it's time has come and uh, and it, it's it's appreciated. Yeah, I agree. And I, it just this this assumes I assume to this that the next steps are sort of COVID proof, right? You can do this regardless of what the fall looks like. Yeah, we definitely can. So if uh, I know one of the things we have to do with the reentry planning is come up with all three plans. <laughs> so in school hybrid and out of school. Um, so this can certainly be applied to that, just like we continue to have department chair meetings uh, remotely as well, and we kind of went to a different way to have child study meetings. I think that uh, having those, those things in place as we continue into the fall will be important. Thanks. Great. Anything else on that, that topic? And this is not something um, that we need to vote on or approve. It, it's just, it's great to hear this update and see it. <laughs> it's it's right. also uh, about your, it, it's, it's excellent work that April did, but the school committee made a decision to invest in this position. The investment that you made was 0.47 of a position and your return on investment is you see actual data that supports that teachers are developing skills to collaborate together, which is a foundational thing to have any conversation. Teachers are afraid to talk about math. I mean, they certainly aren't gonna talk about bigger issues, right? So you have quantitative data to demonstrate that your investment paid off and that resource allocation made sense. It isn't there next year because we had to make some other decisions, but I, I would very much like it to be back. <laughs> so I'll just leave us with that. All right. Um, and I believe you have the next topics as well, the master schedule. I do, yes. Um, so I was asked just to share this with you guys, and I I don't have too much to say about it, but I'll, I'll say a couple things, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. So we've run through registration twice now. I've gone through and collected some feedback from teachers and students. I've tried to do some balancing of some of the numbers. At this point, we do have 70% of our classes with 20 students or less, uh, which, you know, is fairly expected with a smaller school. We are trying to balance as many as we can. Some of the challenges around balancing, um, if you look through 
some of my notes, I make some comments about the larger classes. So some challenges can happen because of really specific targeted classes. So for example, if you're taking an advanced math course, that course happens one time. So if you're taking that course there, that means you have to take another course over here. And so you'll end up often with classes of um, 25 and then eight. And so it's not always easy to balance that because those 25 are all in advanced math. So unless you're dropping them, that creates a challenge. So those are the types of things that we work with in terms of the numbers. Um, I have been doing some thinking, you know, obviously with reentry, we have to, to talk some more, but I have been doing some thinking around, you know, if we can't ever lower some of these numbers, what are some things that we can do trying to still maintain these different courses um, as is? So assuming nothing's changed about them, we can get creative with some room sharing. So where some of these courses are larger, where they take place, there's a room either across the hall or next door, which is empty at that time. So that might be an option to split some of the space of the students within ESP in the other room. Um, there's some of the classes that are larger that are always larger, like phys ed. Um, so that's, you know, kind of that. One of the areas that I'm still sort of trying to work out is uh, band and chorus with around 40 students in each class. I'm not sure off the top of my head right now what a solution would be to that at all. Um, but <laughs> that's, that's kind of one of the more challenging ones. A lot of the other ones are easier. One of the other things that came up a lot uh, for me had to do with the English numbers. So as, as you know, I won't be teaching any English classes next year. This past year, we had already reduced my position. Um, so this next year we're down. So we're, we've gone from four, to three and a half to just three full-time English teachers. Next year, we're somewhat making that work. Jason Burns is teaching the English class. He's certified in that as well. Um, however, the two junior senior English classes that aren't advanced or honors courses each have about 30 students in them. So one has 28 and one has 29, assuming that we don't have any students moving into district. And those numbers are pretty high for our school. The other place where we see some high numbers is in English 9, where we have only two sections of the course, and those are at 26 and 24. So again, already assuming that no one moves in and that we don't accept any school choice students, those numbers are a little bit high. We also dropped two electives in that department as well in order to accommodate that. So I do have some uh, concerns, and as I've told Annie, for some desire to at least be a part-time English teacher to replace some of that. Um, I don't have a current solution for the juniors and seniors uh, other than the idea of eliminating an advanced course and opening up another section of, of a college prep course. I don't love that solution because I want our students to have the opportunity to take the advanced courses. Um, but obviously our advanced courses as you become juniors and seniors in both English and math tend to have lower enrollments. Um, so those courses are smaller courses. I did reach out to several students in uh, college prep courses to suggest that they think about taking an AP course and they did not respond to me. So they might, they might not be as interested in that as I would like them to be, um, which is fine. I just wanted them to know that they could do it if they wanted to. Um, but yeah, so those are some of our, our challenges that we have. Um, we have some new courses. You are going to get an updated program of studies for me in July, both with just with some basic corrections and editing pieces, but also with a course description, which I did provide in here for a new elective, um, which is human evolution and evolution of technology. So I gave you that description here as well. And going through some of the numbers, we ended up having a, a course that had zero students or a section that had zero students enrolled in it. So we dropped that section. We needed another elective during our HI block. And so I asked the teacher for some ideas of things that would um, interest him. And that's what he threw out, which I thought sounded really interesting and I would like to take. So we have some students signed up for, for that course as long as it goes through. Um, so they're sort of tentatively signed up for that for now. So there's lots about the schedule. I could say a lot. I've learned a lot about it <laughs> uh, over this past year. I, that's work that I do in um, my head teacher role. So that's an assignment for the, the head teacher. So if you guys have any questions about that or any ideas about anything or anything else you noticed in there, please feel free to ask. I have kind of an off topic question. I mean, no, it's kind of on topic, but in terms of the, the AP and honors classes, how, how are 
students are they do they self select or are they recommended how does how does that work both i would say predominantly um i would say students often self select and then i can't speak for everyone um but i can say that you know teachers then informally will often recommend to students so if we have students who we know have the potential, um, but maybe aren't demonstrating that all of the time. We generally try to encourage them, you know, you're a B or a C student, or maybe your attendance isn't perfect, but we really think you would be successful. That tends to be a, a point, I think, to um, help challenge them to rise to the occasion. So there are parameters in the program of studies, grade requirements, but it's a grade requirement or teacher recommendation. So if a student doesn't meet that um, and the student wanted it or the teacher thought they would still be successful, then that's usually a conversation that they have. And our students don't have to take uh, for the AP courses, they're not required to take the AP test. Great. I was just going to comment that um, I, I am glad to see, you know, the continued offering of, um, you know, AP courses where possible. And as well as uh, the continued offering of the VHS option, um, just given their courses that, you know, yes, we may only have one or two students that are really interested in it, but it means a lot to them and the ability to take it through VHS uh, and, and cultivate that interest in a topic that, as you see from these numbers, they may not have the opportunity to take in a classroom based, you know, brick and mortar uh, based scenario. So appreciate the ability to continue with that enrollment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions or comments on this? Just say thanks. Thank you, April. You're welcome. A lot of work. It's like a big it Sudoku is. puzzle trying to get it all together. <laughs> it I, will say, I, I agree that human evolution class looks really cool. Yeah, I think it's I think it's great. And I know Mr. Saluzio is extremely excited to teach it and he's a very passionate teacher. So I think it'll be wonderful. I do too. Now here's the big one coming up. School committee get no ideas. April Camuso is going to talk about the Hopkins Academy Facebook page, which will be alive for as long as April Camuso is doing that. Ethan, you will soon learn. Do not look to me to do that. No, no. <laughs> All right, social media, here we go. <laughs> sure. So uh, some of you may have already uh, been aware, but if not, you should look for it, uh, that we do have a Hopkins Academy Facebook page. So the, the intent of the page is to help celebrate members of the community, teachers and students, and to share basic information. Um, I think that you know what's really wonderful about our community is that it's not just the people within the schools at the time that are really interested in what's happening in the schools, it's everybody. <laughs> um, and so a way to really reach everybody is to reach out on social media and on Facebook. I think the other thing that um, COVID has taught me is that when we want up-to-date information, the place that we go is to a business's Facebook page. So for me, I felt like that's what I wanted to do and that's what I was comfortable uh, putting out there. So I have developed one um, with the intent to post a few times a week and I've been doing that. Um, and then I'm also gonna be holding a monthly uh, town hall live, which it's okay if nobody watches, but they can watch it later. They don't have to watch it live. They can watch it at any time. Um, in order to sort of talk and field questions, if people have them at that time, I am going to have my first one on July 7th at 11, which will be a sort of meet and greet for anyone who's interested. So I'll be posting that event after this. Um, and I will also continue next year as well to share information via a monthly newsletter through email for any parents or students who don't have access to or choose to use Facebook. That way everyone has access to the information. Um, but I just wanted to sort of reach out to, to everyone in this 21st century and use that. I know that social media can not always be positive, um, but I'm hoping to curate it so that it will be. 
Thank and so you. just to be clear, you're the only one who, who posts? Yes. So uh, unless she's deleted herself, Annie has access to it. <laughs> Are we sure that's a good idea? In Are case we sure about that? <laughs> um, and so does Nancy Fogarty as well. I'm the one who posts. However, community members can post. So it's not restricted from community members. Um, they can post on there. There is a statement in the about section about appropriate conduct on the page and appropriate postings. Um, so if there was a post that was inappropriate, I can take it off. There is also a, I think it's labeled as moderate profanity filter on the page as well so that people couldn't use a bunch of profane language on there. It would prevent that. Um, and then I check it regularly just to see people so far haven't posted very much, but I have, oh, that's what I wrote down for you guys. In case you're really interested, <laughs> I can tell you what's, what's on there so far uh, data wise. And there's lots of, for anyone who's very, very interested, I can get you spreadsheets of data about all of these different things. Um, but in the sort of simple, short version of it, right now we have 164 people who follow the page. And we've had a total of um, just over a thousand reaches and 656 engagements. And what that means for anyone who does not know is that a reach means that somebody saw the post and an engagement means that they touched it in some way. So they don't even have to necessarily like it. They just have to click on it and touch it. Um, and our posts, that received the most attention was actually shared by Ruthann Fitzgibbons, which tells me that she has many more friends on Facebook than, than we might have as a page right now, because she shared the post about Kieran Cullen. Um, and so that post received more than any other one that we had with over uh, 400 reaches and 92 engagements. And then our next closest was about the 2020 grads, which had 125 reaches and 88 engagements. Um, so I can sort of track those different pieces in order to kind of look at what people are responding to the most, what they like, what they don't like, what they might be interested in. I can see if they comment or how they respond to something. Um, and I can schedule my posts ahead of time so I don't have to be doing that every single day. I sort of schedule them to be posted and then it does it. That's awesome. Okay. Terrific. It is really good. Thank you for doing that, April. That's great. And I know um, while at the town meeting, it was brought to our attention and that, that this may be something shared in a future post on the Hopkins Academy page, but one of our own Hopkins Academy uh, junior class oh, members uh, created the artwork for the cover of the annual town report for Hadley. So Stephen Cutphelia, uh, and his artistic talents are on the cover of that report. Um, and I, I congratulate him. And I know, uh, yes, 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 thank, thank you. you. Uh, Give me a shout out here. Check yeah, it out. Yeah. It's really well done. Yeah, it is. That does have to go on the Facebook thing and in my newsletter. That's right. When yeah, I, first said, I thought it was a photo and I was like, what? Yeah, I did too. Yeah. And it was nice uh, for him to get that recognition and obviously very, very talented. Great. Yeah. Like of the town hall. Excellent. All right. Um, while we look forward to that, I think, uh, you know, we, we've had a little bit of talk about social media here and how we do or don't engage with it. And um, I, I think it's it's been really good to hear from community members in terms of um, being able to talk with us about some of these topics that have come up. But I, I really like the use of social media in being able to shine a light on you know, the um, triumphs of the school, the celebrations that we have, the information sharing, um, and like you said, just being able to reach uh, a wider audience uh, potentially and having um, folks engage with that content, that's, that's really helpful. So I, I hope that it remains a positive conversation. I really do. Uh, okay, uh, fiscal year 21 budget and the update of the town meeting. So thank you, Town of Hadley, uh, for passing the budget, which included the school uh, department budget. The one thing I want to call out for the public and for the school committee, nothing has changed since your discussion on June 9th, where we made the uh, adjustment uh, regarding our staff, creating the one-year position so we could retain 100% of our staff. 
and um, including the expense we just learned about in terms of a, a tuition. Also, um, I did an analysis of for the director of special education and the principal salaries, and as you have always done for uh, your units, all of your bargaining units and uh, your staff, I looked regionally for comparable experience and where that was below that average, I made that adjustment, which is included in the budget you already saw, but I just wanna publicly call that out. And that has been a regular practice to, um, to pay our employees fairly and competitively. It's actually a stated value of the Amherst Public Schools, but so you have done that consistently. And I wanted to make sure that I was transparent with that with the public. That's great, thank you. I know that comes up every time we have um, contract uh, discussions and negotiations, and it's very helpful to be able to point to that um, reference information, but also it helps in attracting talent into our own district. Okay. Uh, next, I have that MOA with Greenfield Virtual Schools. I'm gonna ask Chris to speak a little bit um, uh, about this and then, um, Actually, if you don't mind, because then Chris can just go through his reports. You also have the personnel report in there, um, all actions you are already aware of, right? You made an adjustment with one position and our guidance counselor resigned and uh, we appointed the person who was covering for her for the one year of absence. Um, so that's all right. I reviewed that personnel report and then it's kind of, it can become the Chris show. Um, oh, poor Chris, he's trying to get back in. <laughs> now it's your show, Chris. Could you come back? <laughs> Chris, it's all um, you. Yes. Are you with us? I just literally got back on. Um, I, I, I lost the meeting. I just reconnected and they said, Chris, it's all you. So apparently it connected back just in time. Good time. <laughs> <laughs> so it's starting. It's all, it's really, it's a Chris show. They, uh, MOU for Greenfield Virtual and Food Service and, um, and then your reports. Okay, so the, the Greenfield um, virtual for food services, I, I was asked about extra costs for that. The only thing I can think of, and I have to just kind of clarify this with, um, with Diane, there's a couple of factors involved here, and that is how much extra time might be needed by her staff to get these meals done as well. Um, if we need to add hours onto her existing staff, what that would mean is that we might have employees that are eligible for benefits that, that weren't prior to this. Um, so that's one area. The other one is, uh, you know, we have one employee now who is already working overtime as it is. So what we may end up having to do is to actually hire um, additional employees for this and you know, the, the question is, can we find them? Uh, so it, it's a little bit tricky with this, um, but it is an opportunity for the food services program to basically get, um, you know, some increased revenue. The meal prices that they proposed were significantly higher than, than what we charge now. So that would be great, you know, for our food services program. That's, that's you know, really a much needed uh, shot in the arm, for lack of a better term, for them, uh, because, you know, as you know, uh, they consistently at this point run in a deficit position. So uh, that would certainly be an opportunity to uh, to get that back up where they could be self-sustaining. Um, as I said, that, that would be the one uh, tricky situation is if they would need to hire additional people, we would just, we would have to find somebody to fill that role. That's all. And so one of the things, just a little bit of context there, Greenfield Virtual School reached out to us and um, asked, you know, Pioneer Valley previously did this. You have the draft of the previous contract. As I says, draft all over it. Pioneer Valley previously did it. They uh, are not doing it going forward. Um, we would not proceed unless this were revenue generating. Like the whole point is for it to be revenue generating. But um, anything the school committee would be voting on would simply be giving us a green light to to proceed if in fact we can create something that generates revenue. So there's some references in here to 
Hadley um, public schools, virtual schools. Is there a distinction being made between Hadley public school, virtual school students? No, that was a mistake. I, uh, okay. this is, you know what I asked them to do was to forward me the um, contract that they had with Pioneer. So I didn't catch that. And they obviously didn't catch some things too. I did not catch that. So this is purely draft. They didn't take out Pioneer in some places either. Um, but um, no, so it would be Greenfield Virtual Schools, Hadley Public Schools, would we take the place of Pioneer in terms of providing meals for students who go to Greenfield Virtual Academy? Okay, so the high level snapshot of this is that we would take on the responsibility of providing the meals for um, students attending Greenfield Virtual Schools, which they- Yeah, do I have that? Yes, that's, uh, okay. yeah. Got it. And yeah, did I get that right, Chris? That is I'm correct, sorry. yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and the reimbursement is coming from the Pioneer Valley Regional School District? The reimbursement, the payment would also come from, yeah, I apologize. I regret having this in there uh, when I asked them for their draft contract. Um, the reimbursement would come from the Greenfield Virtual Schools. Okay, so Greenfield Virtual Schools pay us and they are part of the Pioneer Valley Regional School District? Is that, I'm just trying, I'm wanting to make sure I understand the relationships here. I, I believe Greenfield Virtual is their own district and yeah. Pioneer Valley was who used to perform this service for them. I don't think there's any current relationship to Pioneer Valley. I think it's a mistake to have it in there, right? Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. I see. So we would provide the meals, we, the cost of the meals that are cited here, is that, is that accurate in terms of um, what page is this? It's not well, five. we would adjust. So what we have to do no matter what, and I'll make this more global at this point, and then any contract will be brought back to you. Um, so I do apologize for the shape of this, um, but we're, we wouldn't agree to anything until we'd evaluated it. Ask Chris to say, what, what potential costs are we thinking about that we might incur doing this. This can't feel as simple as it is. And Chris noted some, right? Are it's gonna cost us extra hours? Are we gonna push somebody into benefits? Is that gonna upset the town? Are people gonna move into overtime? So we have some more work to do to these. It may not be those prices if we would only do it to generate revenue. Otherwise, so there's nothing else Do we need to take a vote? No, let me bring it back to you. But no, do we have the green light? Let me just say that. Are you comfortable with us exploring the option of providing services for other school districts that are not in a position or for whatever reason, they're not providing their own? Yes. Yeah, I, I, but I think the fiscally responsible thing is, as you mentioned, making sure that we're not you know, losing money in the process or managing it such that we don't exceed the staff time, as you talked about, Chris, where folks now are earning benefits that, that wouldn't have been benefit eligible under the current responsibilities. And if we do that, that we just le at least go into this knowing what the total costs are to us and cost benefit here. Right. Ideally, this is net positive. Correct. Absolutely. Yep. What the goal is, and if we find out that it's a break even or net negative, we should know about it going in. Yeah, right. You got it. Said much more clearly than <laughs> what I was trying to say. All right, Chris, keep going. It's your show. Okay, and my apologies, by the way. I thought I I didn't give the little introduction to that that Ann gave. I I assumed you knew what I was talking about, but if you didn't, you must have really been wondering what he was going on and on about. So. I apologize for that. Um, so we can start off with the expense report. Uh, basically, as, as you know, at this point of the year, we're pretty much working on winding down FY20 and looking forward to uh, the beginning of FY21. So what that means is a, a whole bunch of um, reclasses where we're moving exp expenses to grants to use up all of the grant funds. Um, basically trying to get uh, you know us down to uh, down to zero without going below zero that's uh, that's always a nice thing to have um, and if you look at the expense report you can see that we still have remaining funds which is nice um, 
at this point in time, which is only about four days since I uh, ran the report, of course, we've had another expense um, expense warrant process. So we don't quite have $144,000 left for the rest of the year. I think we're down to about 40 now. Um, but still, that puts us in pretty good shape because we have one final payroll where we pay the hourly employees uh, once more. And, and that's pretty much it. So it's, it's not a big payroll. It's certainly not in the area that we typically have. It's usually around $20,000 or so. Um, so we'll be looking to, to pretty much right, right about down near zero again, which is, uh, is always nice. I don't know if anyone had any questions on the, the regular budget expenses. I do not. Okay, um, we could just jump to the grants report. I was looking at the grants report earlier. My apologies, I actually have a slight error on that, and that is the first grant, the financial literacy. It says we used nothing and we had 11,800 left. We actually used all 11,800. So I just wanted to point that out that um, at this point in time, there's not a heck of a lot left for grants and spending, and, and we can certainly carry those into next year. So that's uh, that's a good thing. You do see a huge amount of money in circuit breaker, but that's pretty much what we had expected to carry over anyway. So we we used what we budgeted to use um, and that's that's the amount that we're gonna carry into next year. It's always nice to have some circuit breaker carrying into the uh, following year, uh, but we are limited in, as to how much we can carry over. So this puts us right about where we need to be and it, it's, gives us that little bit of uh, leeway in case we were to have, say, a, uh, an expensive sped tuition or something like that. So um, again, grants, I did all the transfers and everything the other day, so this is pretty much where we're going to finish. Chris, okay. this is Ethan. Can I, can I just pull my new, new guy card and just ask what Circuit Breaker is? Sure, uh, Circuit Breaker is money we receive. I'll give you the... Uh, like kind of the, the bare bones definition of it because you, you don't really want me to go on and on about it. But uh, it's money we get from the state to, uh, to help us pay for special ed, special ed tuition costs. Um, it, a lot of it is just, it's based, we file a claim every year and they pay us a certain percentage, typically 70 to 75% of that claim. And um, what we include in the claim is, is the, uh, the special ed costs for out of district students. Starting this year, we're also able to begin, um, it was just in the fourth quarter of this year, including transportation, and it's going to keep, we hope going forward, adding a little bit more of that transportation component each year. Um, all, all bets are off right now as to whether or not that's actually gonna happen, because we just don't know with the current situation if they might scale that back or something again, but, but that's what it is. It's, it's an odd name. I'm not really sure why they named it that, but um, I, I can see why that would be a kind of a head scratcher for anyone. And I just want to clarify one thing for the public. It's, um, I know you meant this, Chris, but we don't get 75% of uh, those expenses. We get 75% oh, no. of the expenses that exceed four times foundation. The foundation amount that's set by the state to educate a student, we have to first hit four times foundation and then on allowable expenses, and then above four times foundation. I just didn't want um, folks in town be wondering why she say special education costs money if we get it all back and it's four <laughs> times foundation. That is correct, thank you. Any other questions on the grants? Okay, okay. Uh, the last report is the uh, revolving accounts report. I've actually been looking forward to this one all week. Um, for the simple yeah, reason. Accounts. Look at that. Look at that, huh? Can you believe that? And and the funny thing is that Ann McKenzie is not presenting this report and we have positive balances in those accounts. So that's why I've been Lies, looking. lies. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, basically, as you know, for the lunch and the preschool accounts, we've been paying the employees and been and we've been getting in. We, we had some reimbursements uh, a couple of months ago that were kind of, there's a lag with what we received for lunch reimbursements. So we had a little bit of income, say, coming in in April, but then you see at the end of May, we we're looking at negative balances in both uh, lunch and preschool revolving accounts. And that was really just a factor of the fact that we were paying people to, um, 
you know, for their salaries, but we weren't getting any kind of revenues coming in for them. So you can see how they quickly turned around into the negative. And, uh, and I'd, I'd like to say it was some kind of, uh, you know, secret financial magic that I performed on this, but essentially it was um, something we were knew we were going to have to do. And so we moved expenses from both lunch and preschool accounts to, uh, to the regular budget to uh, bring these balances back up above zero. Something like the lunch account, I'm just gonna have to check it at the end of the year. As you can see, we started the year with $3,700. So we don't typically have a lot of money in that account, but it also goes up in July and August as we get those last couple of months of reimbursements. We're not gonna see that this year, obviously, because we're not serving a lot of lunches. So our reimbursements aren't going to be large. Um, so what I will probably do is move a little bit more of our expenses to the regular budget just to make sure that the lunch program has enough money to start the year. Also, um, as you can see, I added that other column that you requested last month, the Hadley the Kids account. Yeah. And you can see how, you know, we when we took this over, or when we when we took the accounts over, I should say, in April, we started with $75,000. That $35,000 is not one month's expenses. Uh, or I'm sorry, that $40,000 decrease down to 35,000. That's not one month's expenses. That was basically me all year. We've been paying them out of our local funds, um, out of the power account basically. And now I just went through all the payrolls, got the amount that we had paid them year to date and transferred the entire year's expenses um, up to that point back to the Hadley Kids account. So it, it's not typically $40,000 a month. Otherwise we really have some problems on our hands. Um, <laughs> So, and it, it kind of leveled off, as you can see, since then, um, a little bit of movement in and out, but um, we're, we're gonna finish the year right around $35,000. We also have that $100,000 um, account that they had, there was like a gift account or something. And that has not been transferred to us yet. There's still that, um, I, I guess basically the town accountant is just looking for some kind of proof that we were going to, or we were supposed to get that. I know it was in the minutes for the town meeting last year, but they wanted something from the board of Hadley Kids to just confirm that. And maybe they've received it now, but I don't believe we've actually gotten the funds yet. So that will have to be done before the end of June, that's for sure. And that's essentially all I have at this point. If anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thanks, Chris. No, it's good to see that in there, um, looking ahead to what I hope is a continued, um, you know, great program in terms of having the after school. Hey, Chris, remind me how much we plan to spend at school choice next year. Next year's budget calls for 800 and it's 849 and change, so we'll call it 850. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, Chris? Um, I, I have athletic fields news, but I saw that was a little further down on the agenda. So I don't know if you want to wait on that. It's entirely up to you. Um, well, let's see before, you know, what we didn't do was uh, <laughs> speaking of the fields, we had two requests for the use of fields that we were supposed to do under discussion items. <laughs> so we do need to go back to those before we get into our school committee reports and discussion. Um, so Annie, you had those? Yeah, um, I don't think you need to vote them because we just go through. I just need you to tell me if you have any red alarms. We are not opening up our buildings at all at this point. It's just it's just too much for me to think about as I get ready for summer school. I've had two requests, one from a book discussion group to talk about the book White, uh, uh, White, uh, I can't. yeah. Anyways, a book discussion group. I just, White Fragility. I just finished the book this weekend. Jeez, I'm getting Alzheimer's with this. Great, I'm glad my evaluation's over. Um, so, uh, to discuss white fragility, about 50 people. The other one was a request from uh, the mosque for Eid services. That's about 150 people. Now, I, I would make it clear to the parties that um, they can't access the building. So if they need restrooms, like that's a whole different ball game because they wouldn't be able to come into the building. Um, but I, my plan is to let them know that 
they should bring it up with the Board of Health and that if the Board of Health says it's okay, it would have to be the elementary school, the Hopkins Academy field is going to be under construction. If the Board of Health says that it, the plan is okay, then I'm prepared to allow them to use the fields unless there was some concern from the school committee. I'm okay no. if I check with the school, uh, the Board of Health, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, and if I, I would also be clear about um, if they're in the fields behind the safety complex, just about parking. Okay. Not parking over at the police station, right? Yeah. You can park in that little adjacent area, right? Though, but but then are we going to open up the school parking lot? You know, open those gates. Something to think about. Yeah, I'd have to think about that. I'm going to first see what the Board of Health has to say about, um, especially the larger event. That might be more of an issue for the Board of Health, the, the one that's estimated at 153. Yeah. Um, so, but the book discussion group, I think they said 50 people. Um, I hope to attend it. So I, I think that we could use the regular parking lot without any problem for that. Okay. Great. Um, we're going to move then into the school committee reports and discussion. So we did um, have an email from the Amherst School Committee Chair about the COVID-19 um, COVID resolution that is uh, making its way around the mask uh, group. And that resolution in a, in a similar way is being um, uh, tackled by school committees individually. Um, I am happy to send a link to it uh, if that would be helpful, um, but it essentially has to do with um, making, uh, adopting a resolution around funding that uh, there can be no unfunded mandates for COVID-19. Um, and obviously as these um, guidelines for uh, the fall initial and what will ultimately be final rollout, I think there's a concern that it's really, you know, it's the responsibility of the state to ensure that the, each school district is able to uh, pay for whatever the implications may be in terms of staffing, transportation, material expense are the things that are explicitly called out. Um, and that the state uh, shouldn't expect that these mandatory safety guidelines could be followed by school districts without also ensuring that the school districts have the funds required um, to implement the guidelines. So I, Chris, I know you had some input also just on um, kind of the current state of affairs in terms of where we are with reimbursement um, and, and coverage on, on our expenses related to uh, COVID safety measures. Is that something you could share briefly? Sure. Um, we filed about $20,000 worth of COVID expenses with the town. Um, actually, the fire department is handling that claim. And those are for FEMA reimbursements. Um, I actually just spoke with David Nixon today about that and uh, asked him if there was some kind of a timeline on you know, when we could expect to see the funds. There are so many things that are just up in the air with this at this point in time that you know no one really seems to have a definite answer and David was one of those people that did not actually um, you know he just said they're they're working on it they're keeping an eye on things but he just didn't know when the funds would come um, we also I, I think just today actually you know in looking at the guidelines they did say that there would be funds available for this um, it was a couple hundred million dollars so my guess is that um, we would probably see something similar if, if they were going to use the formula, kind of like they did with the CARES Act money, they used the Title I formula. If they use that formula, the dollar amounts are similar, so we could probably expect to see about $52,000 maybe or so of that. Um, but, but that is that is an absolute guess happens. on my part. And um, even if it is that, because we forgot to mention this last time, Chris, um, these funding is sub subject to proportionate share. So That's that right. the portion of it goes to the private schools in the yep. community. Right. Uh, so yeah, that's that's basically where we stand on this right now. Um, I wish I had you know better answers. One of my answers, or one of my questions to David was, what happens to the money if it comes to us after June 30th? Which at this point in time, it seems entirely likely that that's going to happen. 
because what happens with revenues is if you get revenue coming in after June 30th, um, it's now in the next fiscal year and any revenue you receive in the next fiscal year, you know, for a prior year item, it stays with the town and does not go back to the school. And so David, this, this was actually last week when I spoke to him about it, he said, you know, I do understand that and we'll see what we can do. So that's, um, that's something that Ann and I will discuss as well, um, just to, you know, to see how, how we can handle this basically, you know, we, we also uh, are cognizant of the fact that the fire department is being very helpful in this. So, um, you know, again, it's just one of those questions that we just don't have an answer to at this point in time. Right. So the, the current state of this resolution is 91 school committees have um, passed an approval, put their name on this resolution. And I, I mean, I'm all for, you know, making sure that the state understands that it, it's, you know, it's expensive to take on these initiatives, but it sure sounds like they're building in guidance around reimbursement. Um, and I don't think that we would ever say, um, we're not going to do something that's safe just because, you know, it might cost us X. We're, we're going to examine all of the things that we need to do to keep uh, students and faculty safe. I think that's that's a given. Um, but I do think it would be helpful maybe, um, it, I don't believe this is included in our packet. Um, is this something that we can put in for July or whatever our next meeting is? Um, the, the resolution is in your packet, I think. Am I crazy? Is the resolution I believe is in the packet, but not for it's it's the template of the resolution that you would insert. Is it right before the next? Add to the list, basically. Uh, do you have? Oh, there we are. There we yeah. are. Yep, page seventy-one. Um, so I think that the question is, given that it is in the packet, I'm sorry, I thought it was added at such a late time that we didn't have it, but you're right, we got that in, um, in page 71. Um, like Humara did with the last resolution, I would be happy to read this. Um, and then I think our discussion is, are we on board with this? Would we like to um, put our, our name on this to have uh, this be submitted? Because I, I am happy to do that if, if after the dialogue we agree that we want to support this initiative. Um, so again, I'll, I'll read it. It's passed by 91 school committees to date. Uh, this is a live document that I'm looking at, um, the version that's on Google, so that they've updated it to indicate 91. Um, this would be sent to uh, Governor Charlie Baker the Education Secretary, the Education Commissioner, the Senate President, the House Speaker, and the Joint Education Co Committee co-chairs. Um, and it would be copied to uh, our district state senators, district state representatives, um, and to the select board. Uh, the resolution reads, whereas if schools are to reopen this fall in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, it is the responsibility of each school district to do so safely and responsibly. And whereas it is the responsibility of the state to ensure that each school district is able to pay for the enormous additional staffing, transportation, and material expenses required to do this. And whereas the state cannot expect mandatory COVID-19 safety guidelines to be followed without also ensuring that each school district has the funds required to implement these guidelines. Therefore, let it be resolved that the state must guarantee every school district full reimbursement for whatever COVID-19 expenses are required to follow state mandates. We must ensure a statewide school reopening that is safe, responsible, and equitable. There can be no unfunded mandates for COVID-19. I 100% support this. Yeah, I, I do too. I, I feel like um, while strongly worded, it, it is clear that we are, um, uh, I'm definitely on board with this concept. I think the state has every intention to do this, but I think that it shows, um, look, you know, especially in a small district as ours where every, you know, we, you know, scrutinize and scrape for every dollar and we are, we are holding so tight to our budgets that we can't afford to take on something um, 
that is out of scope without really being uh, upfront about what the costs are going to be here and that we need some kind of relief. And also, just so you know, it also supports equity. Sorry, Tara. No, I'm just saying I support it as well. Yeah. It does, it is a position of equity when you ask, what can we do that's equitable? Yes, it would be hard for Hadley. Our estimate in um, our supplies estimate that Chris and I did for 12 weeks based on what Desi is recommending to open school, $77,000 in supplies for a district our size. Uh, think about what that means for a district the size of Springfield has roughly 25,000 students where we have about 500 students. And um, if they say that be prepared, chapter 70 might get cut by 20%. Chapter 70 got cut by 20% and the town passed the expense along entirely to the school department. Um, you still have enough money in school choice that you could get through the year without having massive layoffs. If the legislature cuts chapter 70 by 20%, Springfield will fall to its knees. So think about what there. So it is an equity for all. The idea of they call out equity here that dist school districts band together to say, not okay, because this will disproportionately impact larger districts that are more reliant on Chapter 70 funds, which happens in districts where property values are not as high as other districts. That's a good point, Annie. And in terms of the perspective of uh, we're standing alongside these other school committees advocating for the same, you know. Um, treatment in equal, equal distribution, equal uh, equitable compensation, I guess is the way to say it uh, for all districts. And standing in solidarity with some of our bigger, less, um, less well endowed um, communities who need us to stand alongside them in order to have the weight of um, all school committees being in support of this. I mean, what is the purpose of a state if not to support in moments of crisis like this, right? Uh, where they've been uh, collecting taxes and yes, there are many expenses, but like this was an unexpected one. And this is one where uh, they, they cannot penalize communities for uh, an unanticipated expense like this. Okay. Is this something that requires a vote, Annie? Uh, well, I will have, once you vote, I will have Sue uh, change the template to Hadley, put all the necessary names in, and it has date of vote on it. So, yes. Okay. Yep. Is there a motion then to approve uh, Hadley School Committee um, completing and uh, sending in our support of this resolution? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Hi. Okay. Thank you. I'm glad to hear the state's already thinking about it, right? So that this yeah, it's good good of them to do that. All right, policy committee. <laughs> Woo! This is a long meeting. Almost there, people. Almost. <laughs> Only two more hours of policy discussion, right? Okay. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys have been on it an hour longer than us, so. Yeah. Uh, we have, but you know, out of our love for this work. Um, Annie, would you like to kick us off and, and frame things? Yes. So we, this evening, the school committee will vote on the second reading. You did receive these. You received them a while ago. You received them again. These are the policies uh, that the policy subcommittee discussed last week. Those are the policies, the ICICA that talks about the school year calendar through JRD. There were minor, there weren't any major changes, minor changes that reflect recommendations to the Mass Association of School Committees and from our attorney. The policy subcommittee reviewed those last month and they now, you had them uh, last month for a first reading and now it's uh, a second reading and they need to be voted on. Yes. yes. And, uh, there were several policies that we put on hold. Um, there's an entire I series of policies that um, have to do with civil rights and title nine, is it? It's nine. Nine right? and six. Yeah. Nine and six. And um, we are, uh, we're going to wait a little bit longer on those because we need to identify a champion, someone who's going to. Um, manage those uh, issues 
at uh, Hadley Public Schools. And so um, Annie will get back to us with um, someone she um, fe uh, you know, th uh, feels is most appropriate for that role. Um, and then we'll have a chance to review this. Um, and then there's a whole set of policies um, in the J category that have to do with equal educational opportunities and um, school admissions, exclusions and exemptions from school attendance, you know, alcohol, tobacco and drug use, interrogations and search, um, student complaints and, and grievances. Um, there are many policies that deal with um, the kinds of issues that support diversity, equity and inclusion. And I recall um, being on the policy committee when we first reviewed um, revised J policies that were at the time, uh, you know, cutting edge and if you will, but really supportive of um, the best practices um, for diverse communities to really help ensure equitable access that, um, and they they are still in um, uh, in in uh, you know we we approved those and what you see in your packet tonight are those policies adjusted with um, MASC recommendations. Correct me if I'm wrong, Annie, but I think it's just MASC recommendations, not uh, the changes in the law. Is that correct? Uh, MASC didn't have any recommendations for those, but the attorney had minor That's language right. Sorry. changes. It yeah. was yeah, it was the uh, our own school attorney who had minor minor changes. So not not terribly substantive. But as we reviewed them tonight, we had to recognize that uh, institutional racism is real. That uh, that statewide, we've done a lot. Um, and uh, countrywide, there are bright spots that have been even smarter in the, their approaches. And rather than just accept what is given to us, we just wanted to take a moment of pause and be more intentional about well, what are some of those best practices um, and present them to you or, uh, you know, so you, you may see the same exact policies that are in the current handbook for first reading next month, but you may see some adjustment based on what we learn over the course of the next month. So we just want to be a little bit more thoughtful. And uh, for that reason, we're not asking you to do a first reading of the policies that are in your handbook. Yeah. And um, it's, it was sent to you in a separate email just for clarification because the packet, as you can see, yeah. gets so large it won't scan in. So you received a separate email with first and second reading policies and we'll revisit the first reading po policies before we bring them forward for discussion. So it's really um, the second reading for policies ICICA through JRD, um, which are uh, in the second read state. We have line item uh, markup in terms of MASC recommendations uh, in red. An attorney in blue, correct. That's correct. Are there any questions, um, concerns about the revisions on this second read? I'm just curious what the verbal screening is for alcohol and drugs. Uh, ask when you're talking about a verbal screening for um, yeah. one. Yeah, so the first thing in screening is to just verbally screen is to ask, right, ask directly. My, I don't have policy right in front of me. I'm sorry. It's, just, it's a simple ask of the student. Yeah, right, literally, and and because we've made, um, we we don't treat it, uh, uh, Hopkins. We treat it first as a behavioral health need. We don't treat it. Uh, we stopped treating it as a discipline need. That's not to say if we found a student with enough controlled substance to signal that it was for distribution that we wouldn't take different steps, but. Um, if we suspect a student of being under the influence, we treat that as a behavioral health need rather than a disciplinary issue. Um, so students are uh, often quite forthcoming. Not always, but often. And in our expert screenings, so that's a different kind of screening. We ask them directly. Um, and then we do screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment.
So we're voting on the second reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there a motion to um, approve the updated policies ICICA through JRD as presented here in the second read? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you for the work on this. Yeah, thanks for doing the work. Thank you, guys. Okay, and um, we also have uh, first read policies um, available to us. Right, as a second packet, is that correct? We're gonna wait, those are the ones we're gonna wait on and bring okay. back to you. Those are the ones that we're gonna give more thought to. Got right. it. Well, like, we just happen to be on the topics of race and equity and inclusion. And those are the, the, the policies that we're reviewing. And as Paul asked earlier, what can we really do? This is the work. Okay. We have to make sure that what is presented is really what's right for us. And, uh, you know, what's cutting edge now was not cutting edge 20 years ago, right? Uh, it, was, it was not even like a blink in anyone's eye. So what is it that's right for our communities? It's, it's worthy of the question. Not sure we'll come back with anything different, but we're going to take this moment to, to pause and reflect and, and just make sure. Got it. So just to confirm, that's the um, policies JIC through JRA-R? Yes. And there are some I policies, right, Annie? Yeah. Or Title IX. They're just separate. I, I think they are I. Okay. I think they are I as well. The, um, yeah. Title Got IX it. Policies. Okay. We will, we will hold on those then. Great. Thank you. Um, Finance and Tri Board. Well, I should just ask anything else on policy that should be shared here? I don't believe so. Okay. Finance Tri Board. Um, just from the annual town meeting update that was already uh, um, mentioned by Annie, anything else that should be brought up? Okay. Fields. Fields. Let's see, Chris, is there anything to report on fields? I think we're nothing to report, right? Uh, we have signed contract. Is Chris here? There he is. I'm just kidding. Can so I was looking back at my uh, email <laughs> and 2016 was the first emails I had. And now we're going to break ground in a few weeks. So uh, just awesome. Thank you to the town for, thank you to the CPA committee. Thanks for the town for voting twice. Thanks for all the individual donors. Thanks to Annie. Thanks to Chris. Chris, you've done a great job shepherding this through. Thanks to the trustees, uh, the board of trustees for the school, have been exceedingly generous. And we're gonna now that it's all finally done. I was we've been holding off, sort of making the official announcement and, and doing all the official thanks. So we'll send something out to to, to get it out there. But uh, so many different people have contributed. It's really been awesome. It's gonna be so fun to see the ground actually uh, converted and it's gonna happen, I think mid July, right? Omasta is gonna start, Chris, is that right? Yeah, I um, heard back from them today. I, I got the sign, the last signature on the contract yesterday and I sent it off to them and asked when they would be breaking ground and they said mid July. So unfortunately that puts us about a month behind schedule um, because we had to wait for town meetings. So, you know, we, we had looked to start at mid June and. You know, you can't expect anyone, any kind of contractor to just say, oh, I have the contract. Okay, I'll be there tomorrow. You know, that's not really how it works. So you know. mid-July, you know, I'm going to just respond to them and say, if you can start earlier, you know, we'll certainly be ready for you earlier, but um, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. So Yeah. Well, great job, Chris, and everybody, again, the town and everybody, so many individuals that uh, uh, East Hampton Savings Bank, you know, uh, everybody's been really, really generous and we'll, we'll make sure we notice that. And your first email is 2016, but Heather and uh, Humera probably have an attachment with plans from 2009. Nice. So finally. <laughs> we do. And you know, honestly, it took a person like you, Paul, who um, could span different um, communities and networks and like pull it all together. So, you know, this is a moment also to recognize your leadership in this regard to get Absolutely. it. Thanks, Amara. Thank you. Yeah, it's well, it's been a, a team effort and it's funny. It's just, Chris and I have just been laughing. There's been so many unexpected hurdles along the way. And so this is great. So we'll get this done. I'm sure it'll go off without a hitch. Not a problem left. We've <laughs> done all the problems. 
<laughs> and then it'll be a uh, phase two. Phase two is next. I'm really looking forward to the, the, the two thirds path that's going to go around yeah. the asphalt path. That'll be a great benefit for the community. It will. Yeah. Great. Good job, everyone. Excellent. Our community uh, collaborative for educational services, Humera. Yes. Um, <laughs> So it's been an incredible uh, week of um, Zoom meetings in every aspect of my life. So unfortunately I was not able to make uh, last night's uh, collaborative for educational services um, meeting, but as soon as I have the minutes or the executive uh, director's packet, I will forward that on to the group. Thank you. Mary. Thank you. Um, and before we move into action items, I just wanted to take a sec to, uh, you know, thank Hadley Media and um, Annie, you and all of the staff for all of the work that's being done to support and congratulate our graduates and uh, the class of 2020. I know that um, a, a media presentation is being pulled together. Um, I had the opportunity to um, participate in that briefly to give my well wishes and remarks and I just, you know, congratulations to the class, but also thank you for uh, the support of Hadley Media, Annie, you, and um, all of the administration and teachers and volunteers really pulling this together. And I, I really truly do hope that the class of 2020 feels that, um, you know, they, they are being celebrated because they are, the parade was wonderful, the, the signs, the uh, activities that have been online, the photo uh, shoots that were done and shared. And um, I know I'm missing something, but um, the activities that happened at the school with being able to pick up diplomas, um, cap and gown photos, all of those have just, it, it's, it's fun seeing this happen over actually a, a, a period of time because it's not just one event and it's done. This has been um, multiple celebrations. So thrilled to be part of it. Um, and I'm just so glad that uh, our graduates have, have had this special recognition. Yeah. I definitely second that. That parade was so fun. I think we should do it every year, even if we're going to, and I mean, I definitely miss the in-person graduations, but that was a nice touch. I, I agree. I have to equate it to an Indian wedding where you have like multiple days of celebration. Like one day is just not enough. So like, you know, let's, let's actually like make it a thing that the whole community participates in. I love it. I hope our new principal is taking notes. All right, I'm going to do a rundown of the action items and see where we are here. We did the superintendent summative rating yeah. done. Um, we you don't need point of service revisions for 2021. Yeah. So you don't need B, you don't need C. Okay, great. Um, D, AP warrants. So is there a motion to approve the accounts payable warrants that were submitted in May, 2020? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I will abstain. Uh, approval of warrants submitted in May, 2020. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. All right, seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 How about our meeting minutes? Is there any uh, questions, concerns, changes to the May 28th, 2020 minutes? Nope. Motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And how about those June 9th, 2020 meeting minutes? <laughs> those are my favorite. Those are awesome. Motion no to approve. Problem. Good to go? Good to go. Yeah. Motion. Motion to approve. Second? Se second. second. All in yeah. favor. Aye. <laughs> all right. Uh, we did the second reading of the policies. So all that's left to determine is when we're going to meet again. I would say, would you like, I'll be on a phone call with the commissioner, I think, tomorrow. So if I can get a sense of when that final guidance uh, will be out, maybe we'll do our best to time around that or right afterwards if I get a better sense. So can I do that and That'd be great. send out an option? Yeah. Okay. That'd be great. All, All right. right. Any, anything else for the good of the order tonight? And a motion to adjourn. Yeah, is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> no. yeah. Meeting. Thank you, colleagues. Yeah, thanks everybody. Agreed. All right, is there a second? 
Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Bang the gavel. No. <laughs> Have a good night. <laughs> Thank Bye. you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye.